Okay, so welcome back everyone. So I think we should make a start for the afternoon session. Um, so I'm going to share the screen and then just remind you of the program for the afternoon. So hopefully my screen has come up. So we're going to start by um, reviewing a case. We'll talk about the um, perspective in terms of the diagnosis. Um, and then for the middle part of the afternoon, we'll be going through the imaging modalities, which are crucial for managing patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. And you'll hear from my imaging experts for each of their modalities. And then for the last part of the afternoon, um, both Professor Wells and myself will talk about treatment, both from the cardiac perspective and also in terms of immunosuppression. So in terms of the case, I'll hand over to Vasilis, who's going to start. I guess up. just to say that um, after discussion with our imaging colleagues, we have agreed to avoid, uh, in order to avoid confusion, to allow for some introduction, in, in, introduction um, from them to what they are going to hear, but also what patients should expect when they are coming for some of their uh, tests. <coughs> Sorry about that. I would just want to um, so one um, one or two slides about what we are going to hear. So um, there are different modes of presentation for the cardiac sarcoidosis patients. And we have patients who have known systemic sarcoidosis and they may develop cardiac symptoms, including palpitations, uh, syncope or dizzy spells, or even disproportionate breathlessness. We may identify some um, rhythm abnormalities on their ECG or halter. <coughs> Apologies. And we may identify any abnormalities in their echocardiography. So for these patients, the Heart Rhythm Society has clearly said that they should be investigated with an advanced imaging modality such as MRI or PET. And as, as I showed you earlier, the American Thoracic Society recommended performing an MRI. There are patients, which many of you may have also been in that group, that they may present with an unexplained rhythm disturbance or heart failure in the first, in the first instance. So patients who develop advanced antiovetricular block, such as complete heart block, with or without episodes of dizziness or um, syncope, patients who experience VT, and patients who experience new onset heart failure. Unfortunately, in that group of patients, there is a group of patients that experience sudden cardiac death. And um, a large study from Finland has shown that this may be even up to 14% of the total cardiac sarcoidosis diagnosis. <coughs> um, for these particular patients, what we are doing is that we are investigating the lungs with a high resolution CT scan, and we perform advanced imaging such as MRI and PET to see whether there is actually a pattern of cardiac sarcoidosis that could be associated with their presentation. Some patients may have a cardiac MRI or a PET for different reasons. And actually suspicion of sarcoidosis or even cardiac sarcoidosis is raised and more investigations uh, proceed after that. This is a table from the Heart Rhythm Society and this is what we currently use in our practice. But I will explain based on this table why we often, why we feel that um, multidisciplinary diagnosis is the best way of diagnosing you. And that's why I wanted you to actually experience the review of one of the case with our imaging experts to understand the length of the discussions that are taking place in every uh, multidisciplinary meeting. So we have two ways of diagnosing cardiac sarcoidosis. One is histological and the other one is clinical. Histological is when we identify granulomatous inflammation in the myocardial tissue. We rarely perform biopsies because um, our imaging seems to be um, um, good enough to detect typical or at least highly likely sarcoidosis. But we may have to perform a biopsy if our diagnosis is still 
not confident after the performing of the basal test. The, the fact that the disease is patchy, so the fact that the disease is affecting small parts of the myocardium makes a biopsy more challenging. And also we cannot biopsy every single, uh, every single part of our heart because that would be dangerous. <coughs> so we end up um, doing a clinical diagnosis in the majority of our patients. And this has two, the three primary aspects. One is to increase the confidence of extra cardiac sarcoidosis. So we usually may go for a biopsy of any lymph nodes or skin or any organ that could be affected and um, try to show that there is sarcoidosis outside of the heart. But nowadays we know that even with an imaging of the chest or um, other, other we, or, or, or a PET scan, we can reach a very confident diagnosis of extra cardiac sarcoidosis. The second part has to do with what are the cardiac side, cardiac signal that would make us think about cardiac sarcoidosis in a sarcoidosis patient. And this includes heart failure. And in this, um, uh, in this uh, document, they have included patients with ejection fraction less than 40% actually excluding those that have a milder left ventricular impairment. The other uh, reason would be presentation with unexplained VT, ventricular tachycardia, or unexplained advanced um, uh, antiretricular block. Most importantly, the presence of myocardial fibrosis on MRI or the presence of myocardial inflammation in the PET in a compatible pattern, and this is something that we need to note, um, would provide a cardiac sarcoidosis diagnosis. The MTT comes in as a result of the third requirement before reaching a confident cardiac sarcoidosis diagnosis. And that means that other causes have been excluded. <coughs> Our experience has shown that only if we integrate the clinical information the ECG, the ECHO, MRI, and PET, all of them in one um, case discussion, it's only then when we are able to actually exclude other manifestations and looking at the, each test in isolation. That's why we exclude all the diagnosis based on our MDT, and we're actually very proud um, for our MDT and what we have achieved so far which has been acknowledged internationally as the validated way of diagnosing cardiac sarcoidosis. So um, I will not mention anything about treatment at this stage, but I would like to ask um, Dr. Raj Qatar, who is our uh, consultant in a cardiologist with a special expertise in echocardiography to tell us a few things about what patients should expect when coming for an echocardiogram, for an echocardiogram, and why do we actually perform an echocardiogram when we have advanced imaging modalities? Thanks very much, Mercedes, for welcoming me and uh, allowing me to participate in this um, cardiac psychosis patient day. Uh, as you say, the focus is very much on our audience, the patients. Um, so what I want to do is. Firstly, um, discuss um, what echocardiography is, what sort of information it offers, and what the patient can expect when they come for an echocardiogram uh, to our department at Royal Brompton Hospital. So as you know, echocardiography refers to ultrasound imaging of the heart. Um, the heart is essentially a pump. So we can assess with echocardiography the pumping action of the heart, which is actually very, a very important aspect of clinical management in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. But equally, we can look at all components of the heart, the four heart chambers, the four heart valves, the lining of the heart, all in a fairly non-invasive and comprehensive manner. So echo is uh, the first line cardiac imaging and investigation for all heart conditions, not just uh, for suspected cardiac sarcoidosis. And as Bacillus has, has outlined already, um, it currently serves as a screening investigation. So anybody in whom there's a suspicion of cardiac sarcoidosis, be it on the basis of symptoms or ECG findings, 
the next step for imaging is echocardiography. It's an entirely non-invasive uh, test done in a sort of bedside manner. It's, as you can see, easily accessible. It's inexpensive because there's no need for specialized equipment. It's free of radiation exposure. And so it's safe uh, and therefore readily repeatable for serial monitoring, which you know, we, we do need in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, in general, you know, a lot of patients require echo imaging six, every six to 12 months, particularly if they're on um, heart failure medications or immunosuppression. There's no specific preparation required for an echocardiogram, so there's no need to fast, there's no need to stop your medication. It's really turn up as you are. Um, you may attend the echo examination alone and return home unaccompanied. It takes about 30 minutes to perform, although we allow 45 minutes, and that's essentially to include the analysis of the echocardiographic images. Uh, if you're alone and would require, uh, would want a chaperone, a chaperone can be uh, made available to, to accompany you for the test. The echo technician uh, in this sort of uh, current era, hopefully post-COVID era, uh, still is required to wear a mask, uh, wears a glove and an apron. The patient uh, also is required to wear a mask, that's mandatory in the hospital environment. Uh, the top clothes are removed and you're given a gown to wear. Uh, ECG leads are applied to the chest, and then the ultrasound probe is used to uh, um, attach the skin with, with some ultrasound gel. Uh, and scanning is performed mainly over the left side of the chest. If the images are suboptimal, on rare occasions, I would say probably in two to five percent of patients, um, we need to give an intravenous injection of a contrast agent to improve the images. So essentially, we take 2D images of the heart from various different angles. As you see here, the heart lies behind the best breastbone and, and predominantly to the left side of the chest. So we take images from all these different angles, even from underneath the ribs to look up towards the heart and above the collarbone to look down towards the aorta, which is the main uh, artery, um, and also to look at the heart muscle from that particular view. So it gives a, a comprehensive um, view of the heart with uh, these ultrasound uh, images. So here's a parasternal uh, examination. So this is just to the side of the breastbone. And this is the sort of image that we can expect. So here's the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber. These are the two valves on the left side of the heart. And we can see the right side of the heart, the very uh, top of the image. This is a view from the uh, apical area. So that's the just below the left nipple, we can angle upwards and view all four cardiac chambers, left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. And from that, we can take various measurements, dimensions, volumes, um, and other quite clever stuff. As I say, the heart is essentially a pump. And what we want to do is to assess um, how well the heart is contracting. And in order to do that, we derive uh, this particular parameter known as the ejection fraction, many of you may be aware of it, but it essentially refers to the percentage of blood that's pumped out of uh, the main heart chamber with each beat. So if you have 100 mils of blood in the chamber, a normal heart can pump out 50 to 70 percent of its uh, volume. So 55 to 70 mils are ejected out, the remainder stays in, and then it refills again. So a normal ejection fraction is 55 to 70 percent. That's with 2D imaging, but we can now also um, make these measurements with 3D. And these are more accurate uh, and en enable us to see um, areas of the heart that previously not visualized with 2D imaging. Even with valves, just, to, just for your interest, it's not so applicable to cardiac sarcoidosis perhaps, but here's a tricuspid valve uh, in 2D. And now we can get really good 3D images of the valve, but you can see there's a small hole here where the leak is coming. So all that can be done non-invasively from outside the chest. It's been said that patients who are particularly overweight have difficult echo images. That can be true, obviously, because the heart is uh, further away from the chest uh, in such patients, uh, but we can overcome that now with the use of contrast uh, agents. So here you can see the myocardium is very well lit 
uh, with the contrast agent in the cavity compared to the image here where the heart muscle is actually quite fuzzy and difficult to determine how well it's contracting. So how does sarcoidosis uh, affect the heart? Often the changes are very subtle, uh, involve patchy areas of the heart muscle and uh, can be missed with echocardiography. Um, and so we need to really hone in and um, look for specific changes related to sarcoid involvement of the heart. The heart muscle may become thinned because of scarring, or it may become thickened because of myocardial inflammation. Um, so, uh, and the, the, the echo texture of the heart muscle uh, can look quite different to uh, a normal heart not affected by sarcoidosis or any inflammatory condition. Um, the overall pumping action of the heart actually is usually not affected. The ejection fraction in most patients is normal, but there are cases where it is reduced. Um, and that acts as an important criterion for diagnosing cardiac sarcoidosis. An ejection fraction less than 40% is one of the major diagnostic criteria for uh, diagnosing cardiac sarcoidosis in the right clinical setting. So I just want to go through two or three examples uh, of patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. This is a 65 year old man with known primary sarcoidosis who presented with a ventricular rhythm disturbance. I want to show this case because it shows many of the features of cardiac sarcoidosis. So the septum, which is this wall here, um, is quite thickened. The thickness is approximately 15 millimeters, but it should be less than 10 millimeters. And also the septum has this granular appearance. Whereas the wall opposite it is quite the opposite. It's, it's thinned out. Uh, this is an area of scarring, and this, as confirmed by PET, is an area of myocardial inflammation. And the ejection fraction in this case is less than 40%, it's 37%. So based on the echocardiogram, there are clear uh, diagnostic criteria which suggest that the patient has cardiac involvement of sarcoidosis. Um, a 49-year-old man um, who presented with VT in 2017, had a positive lymph node biopsy on um, uh, CMR imaging. He was identified to have some uh, extra cardiac lymph nodes and that they were biopsied. Um, and what you see here uh, is very subtle, really. And unless you really honed in to cardiac sarcoidosis, it is a very thin part of the proximal septum. There's a very focal area of scarring with thickening of the rest of the septum. And in the apical four-chamber view, this is also the same part of the septum that I described here, um, but it's more obvious that there's thinning of the basal part of the uh, septum. And this is also where the AV node lies. So this is why you know, many of these patients not just develop uh, ventricular arrhythmias, but can have complete heart block. In this case, the ejection fraction was entirely normal, and it's this focal areas of sarcoid involvement uh, which were suspicious on the echocardiogram. And then finally, uh, a 27 year old man with shortness of breath, fatigue, and dizziness uh, had confirmed extracardiac sarcoidosis with lung involvement. Because of the dyspnea and dizziness, the patient was referred for an echocardiogram on the basis that there may be cardiac involvement. And this is a little bit subtle, but the inferior wall here, the infralateral wall, is sluggish in contraction and thinner than the septum. Uh, I think people not so involved with uh, cardiac psychologic patients who do echocardiography may regard that as, as normal, but in this setting, it's highly suspicious. And we use other techniques to help us with a diagnosis here. Uh, without going into any detail, there's a technique we can use to look at very focal areas of the myocardium. And if there's reduced function, as shown in this plot here, there's reduced function in this pale area, the infralateral wall. It just helps us to confirm our suspicion that we see with the naked eye. So this patient had uh, infralateral involvement of the uh, left ventricle uh, with sarcoidosis, and the ejection fraction in this case was very mildly reduced at 51%. So echocardiography is a useful uh, screening tool for cardiac sarcoidosis. We have to have a high index of suspicion to detect uh, more subtle abnormalities. And I haven't really shown you the more subtle abnormalities, I've shown you the more obvious ones. Um, and in, uh, an entirely normal echocardiogram 
uh, has a negative predictive value greater than 90%. So that, that means that out of 100 patients who have an echo for, for suspected cardiac psychosis, 90 of those 100 patients will end up not having uh, cardiac involvement with psychosis. But the pickup rate is suboptimal. Uh, and the pickup rate is suboptimal because it's sometimes difficult to identify focal areas of scarring on echocardiography. And equally, we don't specifically look for myocardial inflammation. It is by inference of how the heart muscle looks, and that is not very sensitive or specific. And therefore, there is the need for other cardiac imaging techniques uh, to be discussed now, uh, like CMR and PET imaging. So thanks very much for your attention, and I'll hand back to Vasilis. Rads, one of the questions from the audience before I ask you my own questions is what is considered to be normal cardiac function? Right, so, so broadly speaking, um, we tend to use ejection fraction to determine contractile function, pump function of the left ventricle. And a normal ejection fraction suggests overall good uh, left ventricular pump action, but there are, but but it's just it's it's a global assessment. It doesn't really look at the heart muscle in any detail. All it's looking at there is volume change, and we use ejection fraction because it's tried and tested over the years. It has very good prognostic value, but when we're looking more for more subtle abnormalities, we want to look at regional areas, uh, and that is where other techniques such as strain uh, come in useful. So, so in terms of General prognosis and normal ejection fraction is, is reassuring and overall pump function is good, but it doesn't necessarily answer the question of whether there's uh, involvement of the heart muscle uh, with sarcoidosis and other pathologies. Um, my second question is, in general, do you think that actually um, echocardiography has been underestimated for the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis? Yeah, so I mean, when you look in the literature, it's stated that the diagnostic accuracy of uh, echo is 25%. Um, but actually, that's, that's not the case. And that's why we're doing uh, you know, the research that Joseph was describing and, and you, you guys have described to look at echo in more detail. The benefit of the MDTs is that we can compare our imaging modalities and learn from each other. And you know, in the guidelines, it says on ECHO that if you see regional wall motion abnormality or regional thinning or scarring, request a CMR scan to look for late gadolinium enhancement and so on, look for abnormalities on CMR. But we can tell that where there are clear-cut areas of regional thinning, that there will be changes on CMR compatible with cardiac sarcoidosis. So, so if we were to look at ECHO uh, in more detail and and look at the correlations of echo with CMR and correlations of echo with PET, actually, I think we'll find that the diagnostic accuracy is higher. It's more like 60 to 65%. We see many cases where we can't see areas of, scar of scarring in certain parts of the myocardium, particularly the, the area near the lining of the heart, uh, as opposed to near the, the chamber. Um, that is still not easy to pick up on echo. Subtle areas of, or even, you know, obvious areas of myocardial inflammation often not easy to detect with echocardiography, but when it comes to focal areas of scarring, regional wall motion abnormalities, the use of new techniques like strain, uh, I'm sure the diagnostic accuracy is not what's quoted currently in the literature. Um, Raj, the last question that I have for you is, uh, do you think that actually, the, I've asked you this a number of times, I already know in a way your answer, but, my experience is that a lot of, our, of the patients that we have um, referred to us, uh, when we actually review their echo, is quite different than the one reported locally. Why do you think that this is happening? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, we have the benefit of being able to perform, uh, allow 45 minutes for a full study. When we look at the requirements from the British Society of Echocardiography as to what is, you know, what is the minimum requirement for an echocardiogram, we need to be taking 75 to 100 images. We need to do all of the quantification. We need to do all the various measurements, and that takes time. Uh, and we have the benefit of being able to do that at the hospital. 
with 45 minutes per echo. And so we can provide a very detailed report. In many of the other hospitals, there are other pressures. The standards may not be as high because of logistical cons constraints. A lot of these hospitals obviously have casualty departments. We don't have that. So there's a lot of unpredictable, unpredictable working, which uh, you know we, we're, we're fortunate in that our work is more planned. It allows us to do a more detailed analysis and we can do serial comparisons looking at actual data, actual figures like volumes and ejection fraction. So I think, you know, if, if echocardiogram performed <coughs> to the minimum requirements of the British Society of Echocardiography everywhere, you will get similar uh, standard of echocardiographic examinations. But, but that's, that's, that's not the case in a lot of hospitals uh, for the reasons that I've outlined. Thank you. One last question from the audience is, um, do you think that if a patient is diagnosed with a PFO, would that affect his ejection fraction? Uh, would that affect his symptoms? Uh, in terms of ejection fraction, a small PFO uh, wouldn't affect the ejection fraction. So when a patient has a patent for amin ovale, what we mean by that is uh, there's a small flap between uh, the right and left side of the heart, a small communication that's there in about 30% of the normal population. I might have it for all I know. Um, but what that means is that a small amount of blood can leak the left side of the heart into the right side or vice versa. Uh, but the leak or, or, the, or the channel is so small, the shunt, the small amount of blood that goes across from left to right and right to left is so small that it doesn't affect overall heart function. It can be associated with symptoms. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that it's associated with a higher incidence of migraine. And there's a slightly increased risk of stroke in some patients with patent for amin ovale. Um, but that's not to alarm people. A lot of, but the vast majority of patients with patent for amin ovale are completely asymptomatic, don't have um, any impact on heart function or health. Uh, it's only an extreme minority where, where we notice that there can be some complications. Thank you, Raj. Thanks for an excellent um, discussion. I must say that I'm privileged to have you and working with you. Um, uh, I will move on to uh, our cardiac MRI guru, as we call him. He doesn't have a name, or actually he has. His name is John Baxi. And um, uh, he will talk to us about MRI and what is what, what should you expect when coming to our MRI department, but also what information we get from such a scan. John, John, over to you. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction as ever. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to be contributing to this afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and it's a similar pleasure to be contributing to the cardiac sarcoidosis service at the Royal Brompton Hospital. So as mentioned, just an idea about what to expect when you come for a cardiac MRI scan, but also why are we performing one? I just wanted to start, um, obviously all of us uh, within the hospital and within each imaging department have had to respond to the uh, COVID-19 environment. And I just wanted to reassure you all of you, all of you that all our imaging departments have taken special measures to protect both patients and the staff uh, in this challenging time. Um, I'm very happy to go through those as I'm sure my colleagues uh, later on in more detail if helpful, uh, and some of them are listed here. But whatever investigation you attend for at the Royal Brompton, just to assure you that we've put everything we can reasonably put in place uh, there to prevent any uh, cross-infection. We are not scanning um, large numbers of COVID-positive patients in our unit, but we have a specific protocol for doing those. Obviously, the challenge is identifying people who may be coming, whether they be patients or staff, and unknowingly have COVID and trying to avoid their attendance. One of the things we benefit from at the moment is actually that our MRI unit is separate to the main hospital building. So when you come for an MRI, you don't actually need to enter the main hospital building unless you're going for other things. And just to flag up that when you come for cardiac MRI at the Brompton from probably around February of uh, next year, we're pleased to be opening a new state-of-the-art imaging centre uh, picture just here, which is just adjacent to the current uh, cardiac MRI centre um, and on the same main Sydney Street plot. Um, so as patients, you will have some pre-attendance questionnaires and questioning on arrival. And again, we ask people to uh, use normal uh, 
activities such as hand gel, face masks, and social distancing. COVID-19 has obviously created significant delay to access to tests and all sorts of things throughout the NHS. And um, cardiac MRI is no different, but, but we are very much able to accommodate urgent scans for those of you where that's considered clinically urgent. There may be a slightly longer delay than perhaps in previous years to more routine scans. Just to say the cardiac MRI assessment itself is entirely unchanged. Whatever the indication for that, the way we will be doing it is the same in terms of the sequences we acquire, uh, we're allowing longer for scans and longer for cleaning. Just one thing to say both today, but particularly when you come for your scan is if you have any questions or concerns, please ask because we have a whole team of very experienced people around to help answer these and put you at, at ease. Now, I know many of the people on today's uh, webinar have been for a cardiac MRI, probably at the Royal Brompton Hospital. Um, but for those of you who haven't yet been and may be coming in the future, I just wanted to give you a slightly more detailed idea of what to expect. So this is uh, one of the Trust's cardiac MRI scanners, and it's essentially a very strong magnet um, that is used to line up the protons in anything that's put inside it, in, in this case, in the human body. And then we deliver some energy to manipulate those uh, and then acquire images on the release of those, uh, that, that energy. Like echocardiogram, this is not a procedure that uses ionizing radiation, so it's not like CT. Um, before you even come into the scanner room, you will go through, most usually with our CMI unit nurse, a series of questions to ensure there is no danger to going into the scanner. And obviously, if there's any doubt over those or you have any concerns, we can deal with that. You will come in, lie on this uh, table, uh, having changed and removed any metal objects. And then we will attach just like ECHO three ECG leads, but these are ones that will be safe in this high strength magnet environment. You will have earplugs and or headphones uh, because the MRI scanner makes some fairly loud noises, particularly during the scan. So it's very important to protect your ears during this. And also we can play music and speak to you uh, through this set of earphones. Um, you can be in constant communication with us. You will have a little buzzer in one hand if you have any concerns or questions during the scan. Um, we'll try to make you as comfortable as possible on the table, a blanket if you feel a bit cool. Um, and then over your chest will be this gray coil that you can see here, which helps receive and understand the changes in the energy signals that the scanner is, is making to acquire the images. Uh, and then you will slide slowly inside the bore of the scanner um, because the best images of your heart will be with the heart in the middle of the magnetic field. Um, we have a very experienced team in scanning patients who are claustrophobic. You can go in feet first on your front. We have prism glasses so you can actually see down outside of the scanner. The majority of patients manage their scans quite satisfactorily, but if you have any concerns, uh, please do let us know. Please don't be shy to say, you, you know, you have some degree of claustrophobia or you're anxious about the scan. That's very common, but most patients we can get through it without any problems. And then during the scan, you will be in the scanner for probably on average around 45 minutes for a sarcoidosis scan, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter. You will be asked to hold your breath for 10 to 15 seconds at a time for a number of the images. And um, we'll give you instructions for that. But actually we recognize, particularly in sarcoidosis, that many patients struggle to hold their breath. And we have a variety of sequences we can use that don't require breath holding for good imaging. Again, I'm happy to take any questions uh, later on during the process of this. But now just go on a little bit to discuss why cardiac MRI is useful in cardiac sarcoidosis. Here we are seeing a normal heart. The, main picture is taken up with the two main pumping chambers here, the left ventricle with the thick heart muscles squeezing blood around off the body. So what does cardiac MRI offer? Well, in many ways, it offers similar assessment of the heart size and function to those which you've heard described in echocardiography. But there are a few particular features that give it a particular power in assessing the heart. So we can assess very accurately the size and the function of the heart, including by ejection fraction, and we have an age and gender uh, based chart for what is normal ejection fraction. So if you're a 20 year old female, your normal range will be different to if you're an 80 year old male. Um, 
And again, some people have to naturally lie within the upper portion of that, some in the lower portion, and some in the middle. As you've heard, one of the uh, frequent changes in cardiac sarcoidosis is either thickening or thinning of the muscle of the main pumping chamber of the heart. And cardiac MRI can assess that very accurately, as well as the weight of the heart. But really the key usefulness of MRI in assessing cardiac sarcoidosis is in what we call assessing for late gadolinium enhancement. And the appearance during these late gadolinium images can be very suggestive towards cardiac sarcoidosis, as I'll show you in a minute, or of another um, condition. In order to do late gadolinium imaging, we need to give you something called a gadolinium-based contrast agent, uh, which is different to the contrast agent you will ever have in CT if you ever has a, have a CT scan that is based on iodine. So if you are, have had a problem with that, it is unlikely you will have a problem with the gadolinium-based CMR agent. We obviously need to put that into the um, into the vein by a small cannula. So before you come into the scan, you'll have a small plastic tube to give the medication. And that essentially is a contrast agent that washes into the space around the cells in the body, including the heart muscle cells, and washes out over a period of time. But where there are changes in the structure of the heart muscle, the washout of that contrast agent can be slower and we can take images in a particular way to make the abnormal areas of heart muscle appear white or bright and the normal heart muscle appear dark or black. And those changes are essentially usually some form of scar or some collection of water due to inflammation and the scar might be due to heart attack damage, fibrosis, so fibrous scar tissue or infiltration such as by the granulomas, these collection of uh, inflammatory cells that underlie the process of sarcoidosis. And late gadolinium imaging is very, very able to detect the presence of granulomas in cardiac sarcoidosis in the heart. So this is really one of the key things where we can form an accurate diagnosis alongside all the things we've heard about on echo in terms of thickening and thinning, particularly if that isn't explained by something obvious like a heart attack or high blood pressure. We can also look for inflammation of the heart by indirectly looking for areas of increased water or edema, a particular type of sequence called stir sequences or something called T1 and T2 maps, which use the natural physical properties of the heart muscle to look for increased water content. MRI at the end of the day is essentially imaging water content in the body through its imaging of hydrogen protons. And we can use specific sequences uh, to look for areas of high water content where there might be edema or inflammation. Similar to echocardiography, for a routine scan, you will not be required to do any specific preparation. But one of the other things we can also assess during the study in some patients is whether the blood supply to the heart, particularly during stress, during uh, a, a chemical-induced stress, is adequate. And if you're having a stress perfusion study to explore the blood supply to the heart, then you will be asked to avoid caffeine for 24 hours. So coffee, tea, fizzy drinks, chocolate. And one of the uh, great strengths of cardiac MRI is not only can we look positively for a diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis, but we are often able to provide an alternative explanation or additional diagnosis if actually sarcoidosis isn't the main problem. And obviously all the patients with sarcoidosis outside of the heart are just as likely to have any of the other cardiovascular problems uh, as any other patient and some potentially more so. So I've said that late gadolinium enhancement, these black and white uh, images looking particularly for scar can help point to the diagnosis. There isn't time in this session to go through all of these different examples, but these are six different conditions with what you can hopefully see are very different patterns on this late gadolinium imaging. And by seeing the pattern of enhancement on these images, we can often uh, arrive at the diagnosis, whether this is heart attack scar-like in panels A, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart has become enlarged and weak for other reasons in panel B, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in panel C where the heart has become thick, myocarditis of the heart, so inflammation for other regions, amyloidosis, a condition of infiltration of amyloid protein where we see this classic um, enhancement around the subendocardium, which is a bit closest to the blood wall and a zebra stripe, black white, black white pattern. Or in E, a very typical pattern of sarcoidosis. Uh, here we see on the right this shepherd's crook appearance of enhancement where the right side of the muscle separating the left and the right pumping chambers is affected and the 
uh, fibrosis and infiltration goes into the front walls of the heart, but also additional late gadolinium enhancement in this uh, bottom area of the heart here, the inferior area. And one of the things we often see that points towards sarcoidosis is when multiple areas of the heart muscle have got some fibrosis. We could also look for this edema or inflammation here by these stir images and the bright areas are increased areas of water that in this setting we would interpret as inflammation, but that is an interpretation unlike PET where you're looking at the metabolic activity of inflammation. And that will usually match to some degree the extent of the late enhancement, so the late enhancement can all be edema due to inflammation, but often has a more extensive component due to fibrosis. Here's just another example, late gadolinium images in the top where we see multiple regions of uh, white late enhancement where there is fibrosis, quite extensive, but also high regions of signal in the bottom panels here in the septum, which is where I'm pointing to that divides the two main pumping chambers, suggesting there is active inflammation of the heart muscle in a pattern that very much supports this being cardiac sarcoidosis. And one thing I just want to emphasize is that cine imaging, so just taking moving pictures of the heart, isn't necessarily sufficient on its own to point to cardiac sarcoidosis. If you see either on echocardiography or MRI very clear regions of thinning and thickening, one might be very suspicious and think this is likely. But sometimes we don't see those and you can get fairly unremarkable images. Again, if you analyze them with the eyes of a group who look at such patients very, very regularly in high numbers, we can pick up subtle things that may be missed. But the point is actually the late gadolinium enhancement imaging is very important to identify cardiac involvement of sarcoidosis. This patient is exactly the same patient whose cine imaging here is still of that in the top left I was just showing you, fairly unremarkable. I think this was a borderline low pumping function by ejection fraction, but we, when we do the late enhancement imaging, so the right side panels, we can extensive areas of fibrosis, these white areas on the more normal black heart muscle. And actually on the stir image in the bottom left, we see bright signal, increased signal, that suggests there's active inflammation here. So if you didn't do cardiac MRI, or if you only did CINE, so moving images by MRI or echo, you could miss this diagnosis. What I've shown you are some very obvious examples, but cardiac sarcoidosis often appears atypical. And one of the challenges that any late enhancement in the, the heart of a person with extra cardiac involvement of sarcoidosis could be cardiac involvement of sarcoidosis, but not all late enhancement is cardiac sarcoidosis. So we often have to look at these images quite carefully and see what points is in favor of being sarcoidosis. Is it obviously something else? Can we be sure? And I just want to emphasize something that Vasilis told you earlier on, that actually minor non-specific late enhancement is quite common and often doesn't uh, infer cardiac involvement of sarcoidosis, but it can do. So here's a patient, just focus on the left. The left is a still of the cine imaging, no obvious thickening or thinning, but in the bottom left image on late gadolinium, we just see this small area of white in what's called the subepicardium, the area of the muscle near the outside of the heart muscle. The stir images looking for edema on the right aren't great quality, but we don't see anything obvious. Now in anyone without sarcoidosis, we could dismiss this as being a non-specific and likely irrelevant finding, and it may not even get reported on the study. But in someone with sarcoidosis, we have to be increasingly suspicious that this could be relevant. And that's not the same as saying it is relevant. We haven't seen obvious information here, but actually in this patient, when we went on to do the PET scan, we saw increased signal suggestive inflammation in that area. So you could have a case like this where there's obvious thickening of the heart muscle here in the top left with extensive late enhancement, these white areas in the right hand panels, particularly in a panel where the right side of the septum dividing the heart muscle is affected and with very clear increased signal on the edema, the water content images suggesting cardiac inflammation. And another very overt case on late enhancement here, both these last two patients presented with potentially life-threatening abnormal rhythm from the main pumping chambers of the heart. And the diagnosis just on cardiac MRI alone was sufficient to say this is definitely cardiac sarcoidosis and definitely has active inflammation. But often the extent of late enhancement or fibrosis can be discrepant with the extent of inflammation on PET. So as you've heard before, MRI is really sensitive for the fibrosis, but 
less sensitive for the inflammation and the opposite is true of PET. So we very frequently combine these two to get the most accurate information. We can also, if you see increased signal and stir suggesting inflammation, use that to track response to treatment. But because this is less sensitive, you'll find we often use PET to track response to treatment. So just in summary, cardiac MRI can accurately describe the appearance, the size, the function of the heart that were described by phenotypic characterization and can often very clearly point to diagnosis. One just very brief point I want to make though is I've shown you some very clear cut examples of sarcoidosis, but it can quite often be much harder to say whether late enhancement on MRI is definitely cardiac sarcoidosis, definitely not cardiac sarcoidosis or something non-specific. And we increasingly try and give a confidence range, um, but we typically, as has been said, the gold standard is to use the MDT and combine all the information we have about you as an individual patient to try and arrive at the most accurate diagnosis, but then based on that plan the treatment. We can use MRI to guide treatment, both in terms of treatment for function of the heart, risk of arrhythmia, of abnormal rhythm, and also to monitor abnormality, uh, ab response to treatments in terms of immunosuppression where there's inflammation. And then both the function of the heart, both the left heart and the right heart, and the presence and extent of late enhancement can inform to some degree outlook in cardiac sarcoidosis. But a point that I think you are all increasingly aware of, and we are uh, frequently just trying to increase awareness of to the world, the gold standard for diagnosis is really through this multidisciplinary sarcoid team. Uh, and from an imaging point of view, we really weigh up all of these imaging modalities alongside the clinical expertise, clinical history, and things like ECG, chest x-ray, lung function tests. So just as a final word, I just want to highlight this quote from Mark Twain. What gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And that is to say things we are fairly confident of based on our medical education experience that actually are wrong. And one of the great values of the MDT that this group in particular, really led by Vasilis, who's kept an exquisitely detailed database of the patients in the services, reflecting on, well, what diagnosis have we made? What treatment have we done? And downstream, did we get it right? Because there's a reasonable body of data in sarcoidosis, but you'll, as you'll understand from today, there are still many questions where we are trying to work out what is the best uh, thing for you as an individual patient. So. Um, I just want to highlight, as, as Raj said earlier on, we're learning really every week through this MDT process and through our reflection both on um, the diagnoses we've made and how they've responded, but now more formally in many of these research, research products you've heard about. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vasilis. Back to you. Thank you, John, for an excellent presentation. Um, and thank you for providing so much time on a I would say on a daily basis for our service. One of my questions, um, and I'll come to the patient's questions just after that, um, is that I know very well your expertise in cardiomyopathies in general and your role in the cardiomyopathy service as well. So from your experience, because you have been leading our genetic analysis uh, in cardiac sarcoidosis patients, what is your feeling that we will be able to identify a genetic variant that could be linked with the development of cardiac sarcoidosis. Okay, thank you for that question. I, I think this is really exciting, and I'm, you know, I'm thrilled Alessio is, is leading uh, on this project. So, uh, just one could talk about this all day, but very briefly, when we look at other causes of heart muscle disease, so cardiomyopathy, particularly dilated cardiomyopathy, where the heart has become enlarged and reduced in pumping function, we see that in some families. This disease runs in families and has a genetic basis to it. That is to say, a change in one of the heart muscle genes themselves is able to cause the disease, to cause the heart to become enlarged and impaired. In other people, there's no evidence of a gene or no evidence of family history. And there may be a very clear environmental thing that has caused the heart to become enlarged and impaired. Um, we know that some people who drink an excess amount of alcohol regularly will develop heart muscle disease. Some women who become pregnant will unfortunately develop heart muscle disease. But what we have identified in some of these other conditions is that there may be a genetic predisposition to the heart changing after another event. So for some people, a gene change is enough to cause heart muscle disease. For others, there may be a gene change present that if nothing else 
happens, heart muscle disease won't de develop, but actually something else, be that a second change in a gene or an environmental thing like too much alcohol, pregnancy, myocarditis and, and, and inflammation of the heart muscle could trigger the heart to what we call remodel, to become enlarged and reduced in function. And one of the things, the most common cause of this is in a gene called Titan. Um, and one of the things we are looking at is whether actually some of the patients who develop uh, cardiac involvement, but probably moreover, some of the patients whose hearts become enlarged and weakened have a predisposition to this by possession of one of these genes. So I would personally, in answer to your question, not be surprised if we find more presence of this Titan gene change in the patients who, whose hearts become enlarged and weak when they're involved by sarcoidosis, because that sarcoidosis is the extra insult that may unmask that. Um, that said, just to say, actually, one to three percent of the normal population have a change in the Titan gene. So, with any assessment of genetics, we're always trying to determine is this one of the roughly 12,000 changes in genes in our body that doesn't cause disease and is not important, or is it one of the changes that either does or could do, cause, could do, cause disease? Probably a slightly longer answer than the wish to bacillus, but I would not be surprised if we see in the sarcoidosis population a similar outcome to. Uh, these other populations but until we do that which we're doing now we won't know that um one of the questions is what do you think is the role of mri in the monitoring process of patients with cardiac sarcoidosis is there yeah. a role for the scan uh, a great question so i, I think again the follow-up whilst one tries to have pathways and protocols that serve all the patients one of the things we often discuss in the MDT is what the appropriate follow-up for a particular patient is. And it really depends what the key questions are. So it just comes down to, again, everyone having a sense of what the strengths and weaknesses of each of the tests are. So MRI can more than any other test accurately assess the size and function of the heart. So if there are very specific questions about that, it can be valuable, but actually for the majority of patients, echocardiography will be sufficient to look for serial changes in function, particularly response to medication. One thing we might want to look for is an increase in the scarring, the fibrosis. And uh, again, uh, MRI is more accurate than any of the other modalities for doing that. We may get some suggestion of that from uh, echocardiography. We may get uh, some indication of that from pet but that is less sensitive on either of those two tests however if the primary question is about ongoing inflammation or response to therapy to suppress inflammation then as i think will come up in the cases later on we will often use pet as the more sensitive marker that said if we clear see a clear signal on the mri so it's clear edema or inflammation then it's very reasonable to look at that and see if that changes, but we may, even if that's resolved, still then think about doing a PET scan to make sure all the inflammation is resolved. And so there is certainly a role for observation in established um, disease. There's clearly a role in screening, um, uh, but I hope that gives you some idea where the role might be with this. Thanks, John. Um, the, the, the main, the main, I think, what I find it more interesting is understanding your view about the role of MRI in implanting a device. So, what do you think that the actual role of the MRI in the risk stratification of the patients is? So, that, that's a, a very good question. So, what we really see in all um, patient groups where there is late enhancement, so this fibrosis, is that actually there is an increased rate of events, be that abnormal rhythms, heart failure or death. And what we're really discussing is, can we use this information from the MRI to help predict the patients who will need a protective device? And the answer is absolutely yes, but it is one of only a number of things to bear in mind. We obviously also look at the pumping function of the heart and, and Rakesh may want to come in and just give a clinical opinion. What is still less certain is, what is the extent of fibrous tissue in a heart that should be used as a cutoff for saying um, risk is higher or lower? In reality, this is a continuum. Any amount of late enhancement can be enough to cause abnormal rhythm, but perhaps the more extensive, the greater that uh, risk. 
equally one of the probably one of the strongest predictors of increased heart abnormality of heart rhythm is the pumping function of the heart so the worse your rejection fraction as a measure of pumping function the greater your increased risk of abnormal heart rhythms and we can combine these things to try and get a sense of who is at highest risk um, if it's unclear, we're increasingly thinking about things like loop recorders. Again, Rakesh may wish to comment later on. Um, in terms of the data, there are a few cutoffs that have been used. One study has used a 20% of fibrous tissue in the heart muscle, um, but it's a very arbitrary cutoff. And I would emphasize that personally, this is a continuum, and I'm a little bit wary of using a single cutoff point for risk stratification. Um, and also very mindful that there are many things that influence risk and uh, in cardiac, cardiac, cardiac sarcoidosis, much as in the other heart muscle diseases, I think the way forward is actually trying to develop um, calculators where we put in multiple um, parameters, multiple details, whether that's function, extent of fibrosis, age, wall thickness, size of the left atrium, whatever these are, we put them in BNP and come out with more accurate risk predictions. The reality is in most conditions, we are still uh, far less good at predicting risk in those patients than we like to be, but we have a good idea that we can, can get that right much of the time. Over to you, Mr. Lewis. Rakes, um, I know that this is a question for you, but I wanted to emphasize on the prognostic role of MRI when we read the diagnosis. So um, on, the, on the same subject, would you risk stratify a patient after diagnosis based on an imaging alone? Um, would you use MRI? Would you use echo um, in your risk stratification? Uh, what is your uh, thought process? Yeah, very, very good question and very nice discussion from John there. So I think risk is something which all of our patients want to know about. It's one of the most common questions we get asked in clinic. What is my risk? What is my prognosis? And actually, as doctors, it's one of the most difficult questions to answer. Um, to, to answer the question about imaging, yes, it's crucial to risk stratification. We, we know that. Um, I think the detail is what happens for the gray cases. So clearly, if someone has complete heart block, the decision making is easy. They need a defibrillator in cardiac sarcoidosis. If someone has ventricular arrhythmias and certainly sustained ventricular arrhythmias, then the answer is easy. But it's for the gray cases that we need to have the data. And this is where I think we've talked about the research earlier on, having our database complete with the volume of patients that we have, linking it with other centers to try and make the risk stratification much more sophisticated is going to be the key. It will involve data from MRI, it will involve data from blood tests and genetics and so on. But we're just at the beginning of this journey. So we really need to, to kind of develop this research to get a proper answer. I would talk about device therapy in, in the last session. So I'll come back to this. Thank you. So, Vasily, sorry to interrupt. Could I just very briefly, perhaps alongside you answer one of the questions Valerie's kindly put in the Q&A, which is, can patients ask to see their own MRI scan results? If I could make, I, it's a, a very fair question, a very good question. You know, they are your images. From the department's perspective, it is very difficult to um, show if all the patients want to see their MRI pictures, that is going to be a big problem for workflow, I'm afraid. So uh, we don't normally uh, allow patients to see this, the pictures in the department, A, because that involves going into the control room, but most importantly, because it causes huge delay in the room. But I think from a cardiac sarcoidosis point of view, um, I think it's really important to emphasize that this is, is really tricky. So A, there may not be someone in the scanner who can give you the uh, appropriate interpretation because um, I'm not present for all, all the scans. And what's really important is that we don't give you incorrect information. Um, but equally, actually, the diagnosis is best based on this very detailed review of all your investigations in the MDT. So for that reason, really, above anyone, any other from a clinical perspective, I think we would be unkeen for you to be routinely seeing your MRI scan results and having these looked at with colleagues. I'll let Vasilis add his comment. You are more than welcome to ask for a disc to be burnt so you can look at them at home. I, you know, I'm aware these are part of your patient data. I'm afraid you probably will be asked to pay for that. 
Um, uh, but I'm afraid we don't routinely offer review in the department really for the reasons that I've suggested. And I, I think as a service, whilst we would very happily go through your images uh, potentially at a particular point, if that's helpful, um, it's really important that this is all done through the MDT and then we can feed back that collective opinion. Vasilis or Rakesh, you may want to just add to that. Uh, John, I, would, I was planning to ask some of these audience questions just before we start the case, but I think your point um, was about MRI and makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. So I completely agree and our golden rule has been that diagnosis is made in an MDT and this is also the place where management decisions are also made. It's not made by one person, but it's made out of a team. Um, so I will move on before answering anything else. I will move on to our um, nuclear medicine consultant, Dr. Sama Wachalike, who has been leading the pet service. Um, I must say that this has actually changed our practice in a large degree uh, since its arrival in 2013. Um, and um, I would say that the input of uh, Sama in our meeting is invaluable. Um, and I want to thank her for all her efforts so far. Sama, over to you. Thank you, Vasilis. Um, and uh, thanks for um, giving me this opportunity to um, you know, show the data as well as uh, speak with patients on this online platform may not be physical. So I'll just uh, share my screen now. I hope you can see it. I'll just do it full screen. So um, why are we doing uh, PET scans in cardiac sarcoidosis? I'll go to the very basic question that you may want to ask. It's because uh, FDG PET CT can give you a re-diagnosis of disease because cardiac sarcoidosis causes inflammation in the heart. And that is the most sensitive way of diagnosing inflammation in the heart is by doing FDG PET CT scans. It also lets you know about the extent of disease in the heart and also in the rest of the body. So it tells you what is the overall disease burden, not just in heart, but other organs such as lungs, lymph nodes, liver, spleen, and in the bones, which are uh, generally common sites of disease involvement. It also helps, you, helps us to find out what is the intensity of inflammation. So we can measure the degree of inflammation and follow that up after treatments. So it also helps to guide management of patients. If you have been given a treatment, whether that's, that inflammation has died down, that also has been um, answered by PET scan. So as in this case, you can see this patient has got involvement of the lymph nodes in the um, thoracic lymph nodes, in the axillary lymph nodes, abdominal lymph nodes, inguinal lymph nodes, and also mainly in the heart. As you see on these images, these are two areas within the heart which are involved with active inflammation. And there are some minor nodularities in the lungs. This is a patient scan in November 2014. And this patient was assessed after treatment to see that all these areas have disappeared, which is so gratifying to see. So it gives you overall disease burden from these scans. And this is the normal pattern of FDG uptake in the body. <clears throat> so, um, and it also helps the clinicians um, to tell whether you should, that the treatment should be stopped. These steroids don't need to be continued for a long period of time. So that's the role of FDG PET CT in cardiac sarcoidosis. So what happens when you, uh, your referral is made for a PET CT scan? So once we receive a referral, you get um, contacted by our booking team to give you information about what is the specific uh, preparation for that. We ask you to do long fasting as well as a very special diet, which I'll come to in a moment. Then once that is done, you arrive for, a, for, a, for the pet facility, which is in Wimpole Street uh, in our hospital. And I must say that in our hospital, uh, in the Bompton Hospital, we are very fortunate to use the PET CT scanner for assessing cardiac inflammation, especially for cardiac sarcoidosis. In most of the centers, uh, the PET CT scanner is very busy doing uh, oncology or cancer scans. And as a result, the inflammation is not a priority. Whereas for us, 
information imaging is our priority and is our focus. And that's why we have been able to give this service uh, such attention and such uh, specialist um, uh, care to this service. So we do a rubidium perfusion scan, which uh, basically looks at the baseline blood supply to your heart muscle without giving any stress, which takes about 10 minutes, uh, not too long. Following that, we then give you FDG injection. Um, before that, we would check whether you have done diet and fasting protocol, assess your compliance to instructions, check your blood glucose levels, make sure that they're not too high. And then after your injection, you will be taken for a scan uh, and once the scan is completed, we will do analysis of these two images, the medium perfusion scan, FDG PET scan, as well as our uh, trust radiologist will help us to look at the CT images, and we can discuss if there are any incidental findings with them. Once we have created a report, the report is sent uh, on our system, which is if there are any incidental findings or any abnormal findings which need urgent attention, we will also email our um, clinicians to let them know that this needs to be looked at very quickly. Otherwise, um, interesting findings and important findings are discussed in an MDT, uh, where we all sit together and discuss um, every patient individually in details. So once we have, uh, so this is the form of information you will receive in, um, on your email or in post, whichever way you, uh, you like it, our team will get in touch with you. They will tell you about what is a PET CT scan and they will also tell you as to what uh, is the diet preparation and fast before your scan. Uh, this is a special scan uh, and it does, um, it is expensive scan as well. So that's why we are very, very particular that you follow these diet and fasting instructions. The reason for that is when um, glucose is a fuel uh, for energy generation to the body, no one needs to tell, uh, you know, emphasize that. So glucose gets sort of metabolized to create energy in the body in a normal fashion. We use a, a similar analog to glucose called as fluorodeoxyglucose. We label that with a fluorine 18 labeled uh, radioactive isotope. And so what happens with this FDG is that it gets into a cell uh, normally, but it does not under, undergo further metabolism. So as a result, it gets trapped into the cells. And that's why we are able to see how the glucose is taken up into various body tissues according to their metabolic demand. So it gives us a map of glucose utilization in the body. So obviously areas which are actively inflamed, such as heart or lungs or anywhere in the body who have higher metabolic demand of glucose will show up as hot spots in the scan, whereas the normal regions show as normal and have got physiological activity. So why do we need to do this diet uh, preparation? Because heart by itself is an omnivore. It takes up any energy source to create um, a substrate for metabolism because it needs to keep pumping. So it uses anything and everything that comes in the way, glucose mainly. Now, how do we see if normal myocardium or heart takes up glucose, how are we going to identify inflammation? So the way we do a trick with the heart is by asking it to use free fatty acids instead of glucose. And the way to do that is ask you to have a no carbohydrate, high fat and a high protein diet, starting at least 24 hours before the scan. So that way the body starts to realize that there is not much glucose in the um, blood. Therefore, uh, heart switches its metabolism. Heart is very smart. It will switch its metabolism to free fatty acids. So as a result, glucose doesn't get taken up by the heart. Um, and it basically, only the inflammatory cells of the heart will take glucose. They still maintain the ability to utilize glucose, whereas normal cells will not. So as a result, we can actually see the inflammation by tricking the heart into using free fatty acids, but still finding the inflammation on it. You are allowed water for about 18 hours prior to appointment only, um, and you can have this diet before that. So although it sounds quite, quite brutal, um, it is not so, so tough. I'm sure most of you have gone through a PET scan and if not, the way it is, is that you do this particular diet, Atkins type of diet until five o'clock in the evening and then have an early dinner at say five to six o'clock uh, counting 18 hours backwards. 
and then uh, just have some water. And since it concludes uh, night um, and those sleeping hours count still towards fast, uh, we can uh, see you in the morning or um, late afternoon to um, look at your um, to look at your glucose metabolism with this FDG PET scan. So as I said, we will check you, make sure that you have done the diet and fast um, when you arrive. And we are very tough with you just because if you haven't complied with this diet or fasting protocol, we will end up seeing FDG uptake in your heart, which is in normal areas and it is normal uptake. And therefore we may make a wrong diagnosis. So that is why we are absolutely uh, tough on you to be kind in order to get perfect information or from the scan. And also we don't want to unnecessarily give your radiation dose to have a failed fast scan and then to say, oh, actually the scan didn't give any information, please come back. So for those reasons, we are very, very strict in checking and asking you to follow diet and fast preparation. So you will come to our uh, scanning room. Here is the, our scanner uh, established in 2016 in Wimpole Street, and that's where you will be having a scan. The actual scan uh, takes uh, about 15 minutes, not very long, it doesn't make much of a noise. Uh, you just go slowly through this gantry and the half of your body, we say half body scan because we scan you from eyes to thighs, not whole body, but it pretty much includes all the relevant areas of your body. Um, the imaging protocol is um, that we will do a baseline resting perfusion scan with rubidium, which takes, I said, 10 minutes at the most. Then we will check your blood glucose and then give you dose of FDG, which is appropriate to your weight. It is uh, three megabecquerels uh, per kilogram. This is sort of standard dose. Then we ask you to rest and relax in our one of the uptake base for about 90 minutes. It is um, most appreciated if you could really remain calm and quiet during this period of time, because um, this is a scan of physiology. So for example, if you are using your mobile phone during uptake phase, uh, we can see increased uptake in your hand muscles. If you are watching something with great interest, we can see uptake in your eye muscles. If you have been exercising a day before, we will see uptake in your arm muscles. So we don't want to see all of this unnecessary activity and we just want to focus on the internal organs. And that's why we would ask you to just remain calm and still for these 90 minutes. Followed by that, we'll take you into the scanning room, do a quick scout view to make sure you are in the right uh, area of the scanning region, then do a CT scan of your um, half body, um, as I mentioned, from eyes to thighs, and followed by that, uh, we will start doing a DG scan. So on su superimposed upon that CT scan, a PET scan gets laid up and we reconstruct the images. So basically the images are generated as the scan is happening. So pretty quickly, uh, within 15 minutes, um, we would have uh, done your PET CT scan. Um, we also slow down the scanner on your heart a little bit because our scanner is sophisticated. So we can get slightly more detailed information in your heart. And so, although you are on the scanner for a short duration of time, overall, the whole examination takes about 2.5 hours. This is uh, a normal patient. And um, what we are showing you here is how a good preparation would look like if a patient doesn't have cardiac sarcoidosis, if they have prepared properly, we will not see any uptake in the heart. So it looks like just sort of faint activity from the blood, which is normal. And again, on these sort of um, fused images with SPECT and CT, uh, there is no uptake in the muscle of the heart, what we see is in the blood, which is normal. If a patient has cardiac sarcoidosis, we see this sort of a patchy uptake in the heart, which is uh, typical of sarcoidosis with some lung changes as well in this patient. If a patient has not followed diet and fast, this is the pattern we see. It is intense and uh, continuous and homogeneous uptake within the myocardium. And by when we look at this scan, we, we just know that the diet and fast hasn't been taken place. And in this sort of situation, we have to ask you to repeat the scan because um, this, is, um, this is not going to give us any diagnostic quality information to say whether this is sarcoid, you know, there is cardiac involvement or not. There are some specific considerations in patients who have got um, type 2 diabetes, but poor control. 
and patients who have got type 1 diabetes and are uh, obviously on insulin. So for them, we have to change or adapt the protocols differently. We have got a few ways of doing it is by asking the patients to follow the diet protocol for 40 hours and patients tolerate it quite well. If you do Atkins diet, which is very similar to that, and we get better quality images um, if we follow that protocol, because if someone has forgotten to follow the diet for the um, within the fir first half of 24 hours, I should say, then they remember that and they then generally tend to become a bit more um, free fatty acid dependent than glucose dependent for the heart's metabolism. We can shorten the fasting protocol if we do 48 hours of fast to 12 hours. Um, this is for people who cannot tolerate to fast for long. We can do a mock protocol for one week prior to actual appointment and see whether uh, your glucose levels are normal and uh, within the range of acceptance, and then we can do your scan. And we ask you to report back your glucose levels. So we then know it is working on you and therefore uh, we can then bring you into the, into the facility to do your scan. If you have any questions, of course, do not hesitate. Ask your questions to the booking team and they will uh, definitely pass it on to me or our team so that we can get back to you about your concerns. Just showing you a scan of a patient here, what we actually see. So this is a medium perfusion scan on here. You can see we are slicing the heart in different angles. This is how, this is the uptake within the stomach, which is quite normal. And the medium also goes to the stomach. But what we see here is that we are seeing distribution of blood supply in your heart muscle, which looks the left ventricle basically. And it looks fairly homogeneous and almost normal. However, when we actually do the PET scan and get the cardiac slices aligned with the perfusion slices, what we see is that in underneath that innocent looking heart, uh, heart's perfusion, there are areas of inflammation. And this is what is a classical perfusion metabolism mismatch pattern that we are trying to look for to identify cardiac sarcoidosis. And um, it has been shown to be a, a good way of um, confirming that this is more sarcoidal pattern than any other underlying pathology. You might ask, this is a radiation technique. Yes, of course. However, we have to consider the risk to benefit ratio. If the risk of having arrhythmias and um, further uh, myocardial scarring is high, then you need to know um, what is the status of actual inflammation in the heart and what treatment is to be instituted. So it's always a, a, a balance and you have to weigh the risks against the benefits. So overall effective dose from the whole rubidium and FBG study is about 11.3 millisieverts, which is equivalent to about 4.5 years of average natural background radiation in the UK. The risk of cancer induction is about one in 1800. However, you have to consider that for comparison, the natural lifetime risk of cancer incidence in general population is about 50%. So 50% of us, half of our population, will end up developing cancers uh, during their lifetime. The risk of developing cancer as a consequence of this dose is estimated at 0.06%. So it is not to be taken lightly. We do not take it lightly. Therefore, we, that is why we actually cancel your scan if we realize that you've not done a diet or fast uh, and make sure that the radiation is given justifiably uh, to a patient after weighing the risks and benefits and discussion with MDT. So overall, um, you have heard very um, nicely from John, what are the strengths of CMR? It is an excellent uh, technique to exclude other pathologies, to suspect cardiac sarcoidosis, to also see to some degree uh, the inflammation in the heart. And it's an initial excellent tool for knowing about cardiac sarcoidosis. Once CMR has suspected sarcoidosis, only then we start doing FTG PET CT scans because it's a radiation technique, as you know. And what it tells you is what is the overall disease extent. Um, even if you have got renal dysfunction for whatever reasons or you have a metallic implant, it does not affect the results of FTG PET. We can easily do that. We can measure the disease activity and follow you up, seeing how the disease is performing as a result of treatment. 
the PET scans have got very high diagnostic accuracy if performed well. So the diagnostic accuracy is in the range of about 90% and above. And it is excellent tool for assessment at baseline, response to treatment and follow. And the one thing I haven't mentioned is about identifying sites of biopsy. So if there are lymph nodes which are amenable to biopsy, so instead of going into the heart, uh, just identifying those lymph nodes and doing a biopsy to see whether this is sarcoidosis uh, helps, uh, again, to have a histopathological diagnosis. Of course, we have faced challenges in the last two years. Um, and um, we have, as uh, John mentioned, we have had to suspend the cardiac sarcoidosis service during lockdown time, especially for PET. However, there is now gradual resumption and we are seeing increasing numbers of patients uh, safely and carefully with all the precautions and prevention protocols in place. So in conclusion, um, I'll leave you to read that because I think I have mentioned pretty much everything on here, but what I would like to mention is that we need future studies to find out the benefit of image-guided therapies which are aimed at improving patient outcomes. Um, and that is being addressed as uh, our research fellows are now working on so many questions that are being posed by, um, by you know, different cases that come to light in every MDT. And new challenges are, um, and new questions have to be answered only by research. So with that, I'd like to thank the cardiac sarcoidosis team at Brompton, um, the Bold Street staff, as well as the reporting teams in nuclear medicine and radiology, and especially to you, uh, our patients. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Sama, for an excellent presentation. Um, I will start with an easy answer uh, to me, uh, but um, what is the difference between half and full body scan? And why do we select to do one or the other? Yeah, so, um, Half body scan. Basically, the reason for doing a half body scan is we've seen pretty much uh, what what might involve uh, what organs will be involved in sarcoidosis. If you do a full body scan, we unnecessarily increase the radiation burden by doing by, by the CT and PET. Uh, you know, FDG dose is the same. Once it's injected into you, that doesn't change. But we save on radiation, which would be um, given to patients while doing CT scan of their legs or of brain. Especially, we want, don't want to irradiate the lens of the eye, and that's why we do um, eyes below the eyes to uh, eyes. Um, I would say uh, one of the questions um, that has been asked is around the uh, cardiac PET protocol. Mm -hmm. And I would like to emphasize on the fact that you have uh, you have put a lot of uh, time, effort, and a lot of uh, work into trying to adjust the protocols across the country to meet the Brompton um, protocol uh, for the performance of cardiac PET. Um, I would like you to um, talk a little bit about that because the main question which I'm going to ask you is what progress has been made in the standardization and adoption of the PET scan protocols across the scans in the UK? Yeah, thank you for that question, Vasilis. As I mentioned to you, most of the, what has happened in the UK is that we've had a significant investment in the PET scanners, but the investment has been made on the back of oncological scans, so meaning cancer scans, and cancer scans have got a completely different preparation, which is overnight fast, and then do a scan, whereas sarcoid has got a special preparation, as you know. So uh, we have been trying to, I've been speaking at national conferences, international conferences, there have been publications uh, internationally and nationally, there are guidelines as to how to do cardiac sarcoidosis scans or actual cardiac inflammation imaging, which are out there. And um, we have been in uh, contact with um, clinicians from different sites and nuclear medicine physicians who are reporting these scans or radiologists who are reporting these scans. And we've been sharing our protocols widely um, whenever it is asked of them to say, oh, we want to do a scan on a patient's sarcoid. Can you share a protocol? Uh, we share uh, that very happily. 
just because we don't want unnecessary travel of patients from far and wide places and the local PET CT scanners, which are mainly used for oncology purposes, can be used for PET CT scanners. However, I must say that the efforts are not enough because we still see second opinion uh, uh, opinions from scans done on patients in different places wherein the diet and fasting protocol hasn't been followed and the patient has been unnecessarily radiated with no um, value added uh, to the overall uh, patient's management. So, um, but however, we are seeing less and less of that as we are uh, sharing our protocol more and more. But I totally recognize the need and um, we are trying to address the need to the British Nuclear Medicine Society. And um, I will be speaking on this topic again in the spring meeting so as to emphasize and you know, spread the word. Thank you. I would like to take the opportunity and ask from uh, the patients to send us um, in the email that I provided um, some of the ideas that they of how they think that we should inform them um, uh, how how we should better establish the best way for adequate information to reach to them because we are trying we're doing our best um, in trying to have them adequately prepared for a scan that is so important as you have correctly mentioned. Um, the, the only thing that I would just mention about the protocol is one question by a patient as to whether you have any options for vegan uh, patients. Uh, yes, um, obviously um, there are vegan options. Um, avocado can be replaced um, by um, dairy products. So we do have vegan options and there are many, um, uh, you know, there are possibilities that can be followed and you know, there's a lot in the, um, on Google search, if you want to find what are the vegan recipes, but we also provide a menu, which is fairly vegan. So, you know, ask us a question and we will definitely try to answer it. And just to also add to these patient information, which can be a long script, difficult to follow. Um, we tend to give menus, which is one thing. And the second thing that we are now trying is to create a video. It's almost ready. So, you know, instead of getting a big leaf like with do's and don'ts, what we are going to do is to give you, show you a video, send you a video uh, when you get a scan. So a video can be easily seen and understood rather than going through the whole lot of information. Thank you, Sama. Thank you for everything that you have done for the cardiac sarcoidosis population uh, and your continued support to the service. I must say to everyone that our plan was to move on to a case. However, um, Professor Wells is attending in parallel, as I mentioned in the beginning, in an international um, webinar, and he will have to move uh, to that webinar in approximately half an hour. So I, I think that it is very important to hear his views about how to treat, how to manage cardiac sarcoidosis I've been following his um, principles from even before coming to the UK, and it's an actual, an actual privilege to have him as a mentor. Arthur, over to you, please. We can see your, your slides, but you're probably muted. Yes, some people would view that as a very desirable outcome, I have no doubt. Uh, sorry to interject and sorry to have to be split. Uh, my huge appreciation to the team and for the whole initiative, Vasilis and Rakesh have been truly giants on whose shoulders I have stood. Now, I am going to address slightly out of sequence sarcoid treatment in cardiac sarcoid. But let me just, once this responds to command, I have no relevant conflicts of interest just yet, but I'm working on that. And let me just put in perspective what Rakesh, in fact, was originally going to speak to just in a slide. Of the three skills required in management, I'm only dealing with treatment of active sarcoidosis. I'm pleased about that. I'm, as I said before, I'm happy to pretend to be a cardiologist as long as there's not a real cardiologist in the room. 
but here the Raman equivocally is. And so I'm dealing with sarcoid therapy, which you can categorize roughly as high and low dose steroids, sec 9 agents, and anti TNF therapy. And approaches around the world, especially to the initiation of treatment, are hugely variable. So we have a steroid-based approach initially, and I would say that is the majority approach. But Boffman and colleagues, I have huge respect for his guru-like qualities when it comes to treatment, favors straight to methotrexate with minimal steroids. And then especially in the USA, some centers really like the space age biologics and flex their muscles and use these pretty much at the outset. Now, that should tell you that we have an absence of a clear best management, but it's appropriate that I show you the controlled comparisons between these approaches. On the next slide, you'll see a list of the studies that validate what you should use, and you might want to write these studies down. Here they are. So yes, what I'm telling you quite simply is that we lack controlled data. That's starting to happen, but advanced imaging has so revolutionized us and so recently changed approaches to treatment that it's perhaps not surprising that we're not there now. So we don't have controlled data. We don't have placebo versus treatment. Our therapies focus on severe disease because before advanced imaging, that is what was treated. And one of the reasons that survival has improved radically in cardiac sarcoidosis is because we now detect milder disease and treat it earlier. But there are other reasons for that. And what Rakesh will cover support of the heart, devices, as well as treatment, they all combine to improve the outcomes radically. So to close my introductory half, the general principles, we have to draw on management of sarcoid in general. We are starting to develop consensus guidelines, but essentially, we have to use common sense and reasoning based on the data that we have. So let me set out principles. Firstly, you have to make a decision whether to treat and, of course, how to treat. And so core to this is risk-benefit thinking. And essentially, with use of treatment, you have to establish in your own mind and in the mind of the partner you're dealing with, the patient, that the risk of not having therapy is greater than the risk of having therapy. And so obviously, I'm talking here about caution. We have to balance treatment between over-treatment and under-treatment. And I'd like to say that with advanced imaging especially, we can do that properly for the first time because our sense of what was happening in the heart without advanced imaging amounted to guesswork. And I think it was a fair summary and not a criticism that prolonged high-dose treatments just to be on the safe side were actually what had to happen, but this is now unacceptable. And so principle two, the level of treatment and indeed the decision to treat, you've got to gear this to treatment goals. Now, I can go to anything on the internet or a text and find 50 reasons to treat sarcoid, and I can find multiple reasons to treat cardiac sarcoid, but there aren't 50 logics and there aren't a multiplicity of reasons. The print principle, there are just two reasons to treat, both in sarcoid in general and in cardiac sarcoid, matching what anyone would want 
as a patient, which is to live longer and to feel better. I occasionally ask people in my clinic if they can think of the third goal once you've covered that for them personally. I'm not talking about carers and support, but live longer and feel better. So in other words, we really should be asking ourselves whether there is a need to treat to live longer. In other words, is the disease dangerous? Or just to feel better when there isn't that risk? In other words, is there unacceptable loss of quality of life? So that's what we're asking now. I could rephrase this slightly across the spectrum of cardiac sarcoid. If you have unacceptable loss of quality of life, it very often does mean danger, but you have to add uh, intermittent problems, severe cardiac dysfunction, conduction disease, major rhythm disturbance, they all add up to danger. But there's also a risk of danger if you have very major inflammation and you leave it untreated. All right, it's not dangerous at this moment, but it will lead to damage and the complications I've mentioned. And then there's danger if subclinical inflammation is overtreated. So there's danger also with overtreatment. Now, I'm going to say that PET and its signal of active sarcoid is the single greatest determinant of how we proceed. But I'm also going to say and show the many other things that have to be considered. This is a contrast. A picture is worth a thousand words. This patient has intense activity. This patient has low-grade inflammation. So we then have three broad strategies. Are we treating with what can be called induction therapy? In other words, we're taking control. We're sw switching off activity definitively. And we're really talking about short-term high-dose therapies. They become poisons if they're used in the long term. Then we have a different approach. And that's just protection. That is low grade. These aren't poisons in those doses. We're all on prednisolone 7.5 milligrams daily because our adrenal glands produce that amount. And obviously you are giving extra, but this is lower grade, it's protection without the need to address a more dangerous situation. And then lastly, often we resort to mycotherapy. You may have seen this slide before. Sometimes you have to decide that treatment is worse than the disease. So mycotherapy, masterful in activity with cat-like observation, well summarized by Voltaire. Now, don't get me wrong, people who haven't been treated may think this is flippant and resent what they have seen as inappropriate masterful and activity. I'm not talking about that here. I'm talking about an observation where Vasilis very much led the world in a Greek cohort, that if you go to people with sarcoid and you perform MRI scans, you will find in up to 30% of people that at some point they have taken often a small hit in the past due to previous active cardiac sarcoid. And for the most part, especially when this is limited and it's outside the context of overt disease, to give these people treatment for that in what is now burnt out and minimal involvement is simply to add side effects for no benefit. Third principle, I think there's a danger because of concerns about steroid therapy to be too tentative when you first introduce therapy, because what happens is that control is then never achieved. And often this results in an increase in the average dose of steroids over one to two years, because you have to keep coming back to try to take control, but you don't do it vigorously enough. And once activity is suppressed, very often lower dose therapy that would never take control is successful in maintaining control. 
So we have a steroid-based induction approach. And by giving a high dose in a short time, we can get the dose down very quickly. It's not yet civilized, but it's moving rapidly in that direction. And you're deciding at the start that if it's unlikely that steroid alone at a low dose ultimately will take control, you are better to add a second line agent at the start. But basically what you then do downstream depends upon what is happening with monitoring. Now, I'm almost finished, but I warn you the next slide is a bit of a cracker. So principle four, it takes a village to manage cardiac sarcoidosis. Okay, I'm going to ask you to concentrate, but from the quality of the questions, I have absolutely no scruples about being somewhat complicated with at least this one slide. So you're making a decision at the outset. Are you moving to a high dose approach or can you be civilized from day one? This might be cardioprotective therapy. It might be that you really are observing meticulously mycotherapy, cat-like observation. But don't try the inactivity without the cat-like observation. That's my comment there. Now, I think there's no doubt with PET partly because you can use the signal more exactly, partly because although CMR can give you inflammatory signal, on average, PET gives you a little more. I don't think John Bakshi will take out a contract on me for making that point. So on activity, you start with looking at PET. Now, don't worry about these thresholds and don't worry. No one of these things is standalone. You've got to think about all of these things. So are you going to make a decision to go higher or are you going to be more restrained? And here are some of the other things you have to take into account. Are there other illnesses that might be made worse by higher dose treatment? Side effects are more likely if you are older. And that especially applies to immunosuppression and infection. If you're age 75, your immune system is also age 75 and you're more likely to end up in trouble if you go on too long with too much. How much damage is there? I've said a village. So for pet signal inflammation, I think you would put together with CMR an advanced imaging package. For damage, I think you would be putting together uh, CMR, the MRI of the heart and echocardiography. So if you have extensive scar tissue, you have a track record of inflammation becoming scar tissue. And if you don't do anything and there's still inflammation, it's more likely that more scar tissue will accumulate. Track record, actually knowing what must have happened is an incredibly accurate guidance. And much the same applies to cardiac function. If you have a track record of progressive damage that driven by inflammation and there's still inflammation, and you don't deal with it, it is very likely this will simply get worse. And that can be devastating if you're on the edge of disability. Then there are the rhythm disturbances. But let me come quickly. If you've got very active disease outside the heart, you're more worried with uh, inflammatory variation that your snapshot of inflammation in the heart may not be a completely accurate snapshot of what inflammation there is over a period of months. So more activity outside the heart drives you. And I just want to come to this key point. It looks like I'm making a politically correct point. I absolutely am not. Patient wishes and prefers low-dose treatment, favours aggressive therapy. Well, what should I say about that? First of all, you may have the illusion that if you're more expert, you will always be clearer about which policy to follow. But sometimes more expertise makes it clearer that a situation is 50-50. And if a situation is very close to 50-50 and your partner, the patient, has a strong view, then I guess it's no longer 50-50. So that has to be taken into account. Last slide, I think, 
Withdrawal of therapy requires case-by-case -case evaluation, but we might get onto that with discussion. So in summary, the managing cardiac sarcoid, we may be flying at night without instruments, flying by the seat of our pants, but a team of skilled pilots can still navigate a logical course based on looking at each person as an individual and using logic and reasoning. But at the end of the day, we have an urgent need now that we are equipped to do the studies, to complete the definitive studies. And I think that does me. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I've said it in the beginning, but I'll say this again. Thank you for what you are doing for the sarcoidosis experts, because we heavily rely on the principles that you are uh, drawing and you have drawn today, but also what you are doing for the sarcoidosis community in general. I want to ask you two things. One is, um, what do you define as cardioprotective therapy? And when would you consider that type of therapy? And before you answer that, I just want you to tell us your vision about your view about whether treatment, immunosuppressive treatment, whether it actually changes the natural history. These are two. The second question is a really tough one. Look, we know that when disease is very hot, if you don't treat it, you get a lot of damage. We know that if you then control therapy for quite some time, control inflammation for quite some time and withdraw it many people don't end up with the damage. Therefore, the treatment makes this difference. Somebody is left with major damage versus they're not left with major damage. So in my book, that's changing the natural history. Now, the trouble is people who have these trials where they withdraw therapy incredibly quickly and the disease relapses, and then they say, aha, the natural history is not being changed. Well. The problem with that, this activity is an immune overstatement and the immune system takes time to forget. So the answer is that if you treat properly in the right way, it most certainly affects the natural history, but you have to do that or actually it probably won't. Now, I think you asked one other question, cardioprotective therapy. Look, this is this balance between risk and benefit. And when the danger is lower, and but still possible, sometimes it's correct to take the edge off what is lower grade inflammation to protect the heart without risking the side effects for what is probably unnecessarily vigorous treatment. Now I've done an EG there, prednis of only 7.5 milligrams daily, but you've got to take into account, people are highly individual as to how sensitive to steroid side effects they are. So you're really making different deals with different people and working out what is a civilized dose of steroid with time. But what you're not doing is giving them the burden of too much therapy. And hydroxychloroquine can, for some people, be a real boon as a drug that does not immunosuppress. But I'm giving you a spectrum of what I call cardioprotective therapy. You're not trying to get a dramatic response, but you're trying to, to protect against insidious damage. Often those are 50-50 calls and you have to wheel and deal with people, discuss their side effects, and actually reach a sensible and civilized long-term approach. Prof, uh, another question is, we often rely on PET to draw conclusions regarding cardiac sarcoidosis activity. And many of our patients live quite far away and we've limited access to PET unless they travel to the Brompton do you have in your in your assessment any tips about when should a patient approach his team with a possible flare of his condition suggesting disease activity and therefore probably cardiac sarcoidosis activity? Well, my only tip is that if there are changes that are unexplained, 
it, it's crucial to seek advice. Now you will understand, I'm sure, you're really asking, you've got clues, it might be worsening breathlessness, it might be a sense of palpitation, it might be that you've got a flare of general sarcoid activity and your concern is that in the heart the inflammation is changing to mirror what is happening in what you can detect. And I can come up with a whole lot of individual scenarios, obviously, but I don't think that's very helpful in providing advice as to what to do. Firstly, if there is clearly a significant change, seeking medical advice is right. Now, it's often appropriate to talk to a local GP because sometimes these changes are simple infection. And I think you then have to discuss that and sometimes an antibiotic trial will be instituted if there is reason to think there might be infection explaining a change. But there will be a point where this is no longer logical and the crucial thing at that point is to be in touch to discuss further investigation. Now, whether it happens to be PET is going to be dependent on the scenario, isn't it? Very often, if you're in doubt, repeating the PET becomes rather crucial. And it's crucial whether you're distant from PET, if it is crucial, or whether you're close to PET. So I'm not sure that I would have a different approach for what is definitely needed, depending on how geographically distant people are from PET. Uh, I could say a lot more, but I'm at risk of becoming diffuse because it is a difficult question. So you must guide me as to what else you want from me on this. Um, no, I think that is um, a fair answer and uh, um, an important one to a very difficult question, actually. Um, to what extent you would um, consider fatigue as a target of therapy, even if you have cardiac sarcoidosis inactivity? Oh, yes, fatigue. Yes, I'm sorry to the DWP. They're great within the department, but I'm afraid the process has a lot of people who are not having this recognised, and it is difficult. Now, firstly, fatigue is hugely resistant to traditional sarcoid treatments, usually. You've got to find that out because sometimes low-dose steroid actually is transformational or another low dose of a second line agent. But uh, I think it's a terribly difficult issue. And I could go off on one talking about other things you do for fatigue. I think firstly, if you do have flares and fatigue, it supports the idea that you've got a flare of sarcoid. Uh, fatigue in general will occur with episodes of immune dysregulation. What you then do about it, I think, comes down to things other than the standard therapies. And I will just mention very fast in a single sentence, fatigue diaries, in order to allow you to try to control fatigue, making sure that being unhappy or having sleep disturbance is not responsible. Thinking about the use of ginkgo, taking time with these interventions, and then thinking about Ritalin, which has been shown in controlled trials in sarcoid to improve sarcoid fatigue. It's not an anti-inflammatory drug. It's actually used for attention deficit syndromes in children. So it's a whole different ballgame fatigue. It's really difficult for disability assessment because you can't do a blood test and measure fatigue. It's disabling. And you look well when you've got fatigue. So people like <coughs> families, sometimes your doctor, and believe that it's all in your mind. That's a terrible problem. Uh, so that's unless you've uh, opened up a Pandora's box at this point with this question. So once again, I'm going to stop and allow you to guide me on what else you want from me. I must say that um, we only have two more minutes for you. So I 
I must say at this point, um, again, thank you for, for coming to this event and for sharing with us your experience um, as well as your advice. Um, I, would, I would like to move to Dr. Rakesh Sharma, um, who has learned me a lot about cardiology, I must say. Um, it is an absolute privilege to work with him on a daily basis and be able to transform this uh, joint, um, joint service um, uh, moving forward and reaching even a national service level. Uh, Rakes, although we are changing the program depending on the demands of each of the speakers, which I think is fair, uh, I would prefer that you give us a few comments regarding the cardiac therapy before we move on to the actual discussion of one of our cases in a live MDT fashion, uh, which uh, has been fascinating. Over to you. Thank you very much, Vasilis, and um, thank you, Athel. I always learn a lot from all of my colleagues, and this is one of the key things about the MDTs that we learn from each other, and every week we always um, add to our knowledge. So I know we're going to be running out of time, which is quite similar to what we do in our clinical practice. We often run out of time when it comes to our MDT meetings. So um, I'll be talking about principles as well, um, this time from the Carter perspective. It's obviously a large topic to cover in just one short session, but hopefully you'll get some take home messages from this and do feel free to add questions to the chat function. So when it comes to the um, cardiac management of cardiac sarcoidosis, it's useful to um, group this into different categories. So one of the key things is arrhythmia management. And in fact, one of the most common modes of presentation is patients who present with arrhythmias. So this can be complete heart block, it can be a ventricular arrhythmia or failed um, sudden death. So these are important arrhythmias, life-threatening arrhythmias by which patients present um, to doctors. Now, we're trying to encourage all cardiologists around the UK to think about cardiac sarcoidosis as a potential diagnosis, particularly when patients present with unexplained arrhythmias um, and they're relatively young. Now, the, the age cutoff varies. As I, as I get older, the age cutoff goes up as well. So we tend to recommend, certainly for anyone under the age of 60, they should have a comprehensive assessment um, to exclude cardiac sarcoidosis if the arrhythmia is unexplained. Um, but certainly, there's no strict age cutoff. When we talk about arrhythmia management, we're talking about um, medication and we also talk about devices, which I'll touch upon. Um, the other aspect of treating patients with advanced cardiac sarcoidosis is that some of these patients sadly do develop heart failure. And heart failure is where the pump function of the heart is not adequate to support the needs of the body. And um, we do need to make sure we manage patients um, appropriately. And um, this is where our expertise comes in as well. And also a subgroup of patients with cardiac sarcoidosis can develop pulmonary hypertension. And we have the privilege of working at the World Bompton where we have the National Pulmonary Hypertension Service. We've got experts in this area who do advise us. I'm not gonna talk about indiscretion in any depth because obviously um, my colleagues, um, Athol and Vasilis are experts in this and uh, we take their advice, but just to give you some principles um, as a cardiologist as what we're looking for when it comes to managing patients in indiscretion. So just a, a few words about um, devices. So um, if a patient presents with complete heart block, um, they'll need a pacemaker. But if the diagnosis is um, cardiac sarcoidosis, um, the recommended device is actually a cardiac defibrillator. Um, the reason for this is that a cardiac defibrillator will provide all the functions of a pacemaker. But importantly, if the patient in the future was to develop cardiac arrest due to a ventricular arrhythmia, the defibrillator can treat this as well. So we don't like patients to have too many unnecessary procedures. So certainly if a patient presents with complete heart block and um, the condition is uncertain as to why this happened, um, we would recommend an MRI scan and a discussion as to whether or not this patient could have cardiac sarcoidosis. Very often patients would have all of these tests done quite quickly um, and then we can make a decision about the device. Um, so certainly a defibrillator would be the key. Um, some patients who have heart failure um, also need a third lead. So these are defibrillators, which also um, pace the left side of the heart as well as the right. So this is known as a resynchronization device. So this is for a subgroup of patients 
um, with heart failure who, who need this special device. But certainly um, these devices can improve outcome for our patients. With these defibrillators, um, we get a wealth of data about the patient's rhythm management um, subsequently because we can um, track and monitor um, the patient's rhythm, even if they don't have symptoms. So very often we're getting emails and, and requests from our pacemaker clinics about patients who have cardiac sarcoidosis who've got these devices in place, and then we get alerts about rhythm disturbances going forward. One question which we often get asked is whether or not patients who have devices can have a cardiac MRI scan. Well, certainly at our institution um, with John Bakshi, um, we've actually um, got a protocol for scanning patients with devices, even if they're not MRI conditional, meaning older devices which don't have um, approval for MRI scans with the right um, protocol, we can safely scan those patients. But certainly all modern devices which are implanted are actually MRI compatible. When it comes to um, following up these patients, we tend to um, rely on echo and, and mainly PET, but when patients have devices, we can still follow up with MRI, but we have to accept there may be some artifact um, from the generator box. So just to touch upon the principles of heart failure management. So um, this is one of my um, main subspecialty interests. So heart failure, as I said, is where the heart pump is not um, maintaining the, the circulation. Um, and certainly when the heart pump is weakened due to scarring the heart, um, we need to make sure that the patient's medical therapy is optimized. So there are a range of different drugs which have been shown over many trials over the last two to three decades, which can improve outcome. And also um, some of these special resynchronization devices in a subgroup of patients can also help. So this is where we're very much reliant on our specialist nurse, um, Sue Gilmore, to try and help guide patients in terms of introducing these medicines and up titrating the medicines. And also this is where it's important to emphasize um, that we have a shared care approach with local centers, because very often when these medicines are started, um, the patient will need monitoring of their blood pressure, um, the kidney function, their salts, and all of that needs to be done locally and safely so patients are managed appropriately. So this is a, a very important part of our network. So just to say a couple of words about the immunosuppression side. So as I say, this is something which um, both Athol and Vasilis um, guide us on and it's their kind of remit. But as a cardiologist, um, the focus for immunosuppression is to try and prevent active inflammation from leading to irreversible fibrosis or scarring in the heart. Because sadly, when there is fibrosis in the heart, this tends to be a permanent um, situation. And the fibrosis can lead to intractable rhythm disturbance of the heart and also to heart failure, which can be quite difficult to treat. So we've actually set up at the Brompton an alert system where actually if patients have a PET scan and it comes back as being positive, we're alerted. We will often fast track discussion in our MDT meeting so that we can decide what to do with the depression and how best to protect the patient. So um, the other um, question we've been asked by patients during the pandemic is what is the risk of immunosuppression and the risk of contracting COVID-19? So I remember the discussions we had at the beginning of the pandemic um, in March of last year, um, there's a lot of concern about patients with cardiac sarcoidosis who are taking steroids and whether or not there would be an increased risk of developing severe COVID infections. Thankfully, we have not seen that to be the case. And in fact, you'll be aware that um, steroids have been shown to be protective in patients being hospitalized with COVID-19 infection. Having said that, um, one of the concerns is the efficacy of vaccines in patients who are immunosuppressed. And certainly if the immune response is downregulated, um, then the vaccine efficacy may be lower, um, and, but hopefully the booster um, will help try and improve the outcome in this situation. So I know we've got a case to discuss as well, and we're already over time. So I made the stop there. Um, Vasilis, I'm very happy to take questions um, from anyone from the chat. If that's so, um, Rakesh, I would, I would like to ask you um, whether you feel that patients with cardiac sarcoidosis and heart failure are in a different risk compared to other patients with heart failure, and if so, why? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, what we tend to find is that the patients with cardiac sarcoidosis who unfortunately have heart failure, they tend to be a younger cohort compared to um, the average heart failure patient in the UK. Um, the mechanism for developing heart failure in cardiac sarcoidosis is through the generation of fibrosis within the heart. 
And as I mentioned, the fibrosis can be sometimes difficult to treat. In other forms of heart failure where there's very little scar, such as for example, in patients with a dilated heart myopathy, we, found, we find the outcome tends to be better in terms of improvement of cardiac function. But having said that, um, even if there's scar within the heart, um, we should be um, able to improve the cardiac function with good medical therapy. And we have a host of different drugs which we can use to do that. In terms of risk, it goes back to one of our previous discussions that we had, how do we um, subgroup patients in terms of their risk and in which patients should be concerned and, and offering devices. Um, again, this is, this is an area where we need more data. So hopefully um, the database which you and I are generating um, will answer some of these questions. And, and going back to what John Bakshi said earlier, ideally we'd have a, a risk calculator, a bit like is the case for other cardiomyopathies where we can put in all the data we have about the patients and give a more accurate risk score um, about um, the patient in front of us. One quick question from the attendees uh, is, is it inevitable that a patient with extensive myocardial fibrosis will go on to develop heart failure? And is there anything that we can do to prevent here says the heart block, but I will expand this to life-threatening arrhythmias. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So we know that there is a, a clear correlation between fibrosis and arrhythmias. Um, it's difficult to know how to prevent fibrosis from occurring unless there's active inflammation, in which case we would want to prevent fibrosis with immunosuppression, mainstay being steroids. In, in the absence of um, inflammation in the heart, um, how can we prevent um, heart block? Well, that's a, that's a difficult question. The mechanism for heart block in patients with cardiosarcoidosis is often due to inflammation in the septum, which is where the AV node is, and that can lead to um, problems with heart block. And, and we would often do an MRI scan in that situation and, and look for evidence of involvement in the septum. But as you know, we've, we've done many scans in patients who've had complete heart block, and we look at the MRI scan, and we can't tell um, if there is fibrosis there, and that could be because the resolution of the MRI is not good enough to detect um, problems at the cellular level. So for the patient um, in front of us, I think the message really is, is that um, it's all about surveillance and ongoing monitoring. Um, it's important that patients with a lot of scarring are monitored more frequently. Certainly it's important that patients who have active disease on their PET are monitored more closely. Um, in, in terms of lifestyle changes that you can do, there's nothing specific for preventing heart block or life-threatening arrhythmias, but it's all, it's all about surveillance. And again, some of the studies which we're doing, such as the ILR study, maybe, maybe we'll be able to um, enable us to answer some of those questions and also to enable us to be closer to our patients to try and assess their rhythmic risk. Um, very quickly, one last question is, in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis, what is your advice about exercise? Okay, good. So um, this comes back to um, the individual. So effectively, if a patient has cardiac sarcoidosis and the disease is inactive, meaning there's no active inflammation in the heart, then generally speaking, we would ask them to exercise. So it depends on the degree of cardiac impairment. Um, if the patient, even if the patient has cardiac impairment or heart failure, providing the disease is not active, meaning there's no active inflammation, we would still ask patients to exercise and encourage that. We generally recommend cardiovascular exercise. And in fact, we would counsel all patients to do some exercise every day to try and improve their um, kind of excess capacity. Where there's active inflammation in the heart, then we tend to adopt the, the guidance from the myocarditis um, guidelines, which recommend that if there's active inflammation, we would avoid, we recommend patients avoiding exercise, certainly moderate to high intensity, because there is an arrhythmic risk in that population. Um, it doesn't mean that patients can't do everyday walking and simple exercise. Obviously, that's not going to be um, recommended, but certainly moderate to high intensity exercise should be avoided if there's active myocardial inflammation. And last question before we move on to the case. Do you think that if a patient experiences ectopics, um, is, there a target for, is this a target for treatment? Good. So ectopic activity um, is a very broad spectrum. So we all get ectopics. So ectopics is basically where the extra heart beats. So if you were to put a heart monitor, a HALT monitor on an individual, um, we'd all get ectopics during the 25 period. So the question is how frequent are the ectopics? So um, if the ectopics are very frequent, so if you're talking about thousands of ectopics in a day, um, then it depends on, on where they're coming from. Are they coming from the upper chambers, from the lower chambers? Very often ectopics are benign. Some people can obviously experience them and they can feel the sensation of extra beats or skip beats. 
in the majority, they'll be benign. But sometimes if the topics occur in, in runs or sequences, they can be precursors for arrhythmias. So it's a very broad question. Um, to answer it in, in a nutshell, essentially, in most cases, we would, would monitor. But in some cases, if the topics are very frequent, we would investigate and, and treat. But that's not that common. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, we can move to a simulation of our MDD. So um, I, although we now have a huge help from the junior doctors from cardiology, um, I will take the lead in presenting the case. I would suggest that as, as it happens in our MDD, um, Rakes is leading the discussion. Um, I will play the role of the sarcoidosis expert uh, in Athol's absence, and then we will ask um, the patients, the, we will ask the imaging colleagues to comment on the imaging of a case that we have already prepared. Uh, this is an actual case that actually the discussion took place, I think, three or four months ago, and um, I'll make a start. I must say, while I'm preparing, that this is the most fascinating aspect of what we're doing. And I'm uh, hugely supportive of this approach in our patients. So this is a 48-year-old gentleman who, has a, who is a known smoker, had a long-standing history of Zilbert syndrome unrelated to the current presentation. And he had a history of unprovoked pulmonary embolism six months ago. He presented with breathlessness, worsening exercise tolerance, and abdominal distension. His CT scan uh, upon uh, uh, presentation showed hyalurone and subcarinal lymphadenopathy in the chest with, uh, with some nodules. And his echocardiogram will be commented later on. He was also, he was only on a Pixaban, five milligrams twice a day. His physical examination showed some reduced lung sounds, uh, normal heart sounds with a murmur in the dry cuspid region, and lung function tests were more or less preserved. He had only mild gas transfer impairment. The blood test showed lymphopenia, elevated ACE, slightly elevated high sensitive troponin, and significantly elevated BMP. This was his original. Um, ECG and Rakis, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Yeah, so if you look at the ECG, if you look at the rhythm strip here, so these um, little complexes here, they represent atrial activity here, and these larger complexes represent ventricular activity. So you can see that there's difficult to explain to a layperson, but you've got intermittent atrial activity and ventricular activity with some variation in the association between the two. So this is a a patient with conduction system disease affecting the AV node. So this is the junction box. Uh, so basically, um, when patients have conduction disease, it can affect different parts of the conduction tree. So the AV node is basically the junction box, if you like, between the upper and the lower chambers. Thank you. Um, so we're going to review the patient's echocardiogram, cardiac MRI, and cardiac PET. Okay, so let me share the screen with you. Okay, so I'll just, uh, I've got some selected images of the echocardiogram performed at his presentation to us. So I mean, the first thing that's notable is that the right ventricle, the right heart is dilated and the contraction of the right ventricle is reduced. That's at the top part of this image. Then the left ventricle, here the septum, which separates the left ventricle from the right ventricle, is thickened. And the sort of echo texture, the appearance of it is it's quite a granular appearance. Normally you don't see such a speckled pattern uh, of the myocardium, but here we do, particularly of the septum. This lower part of the left ventricle is also uh, not contracting well. Um, and so it's a global process that's affecting the left ventricle 
and the right ventricle. So often we see very focal patterns, but here it's much more, the appearance is much more generalized. This is short axis view. So in effect, we've taken a slice of the left ventricle in an on fast position, whereas the previous one was in its sort of long axis. So here again, there's a septum separating the right ventricle from the left ventricle. And again, it's thickened and it's got this very speckled appearance. The overall contraction of the heart is reduced. The pumping action is definitely compromised. These are the, all four heart chambers in the apical view. So here is the left ventricle and similar appearance, very sluggish contraction. The right ventricle is markedly dilated and severely impaired in, in its contraction. And both of the atria, which are the feeding chambers for the contracting chambers, the ventricles, uh, both the atria, atria are quite markedly dilated. And because of the impairment of contraction and the dilatation of the chambers, we're seeing leaking of the mitral valve. It's the secondary consequence of the heart muscle pathology. Not only is the right ventricle enlarged, but the valve, which normally closes fully to allow the ventricle to contract and the filling chamber to fill, that valve is completely leaky. The two leaflets are not meeting together. There's a severe leaking of that valve because of the enlargement and because of the impaired function of the right ventricle. So those are the changes. Uh, we had a closer look at the left ventricle by giving contrast. So in patients in whom we want to get a, get a better appearance of the heart muscle myocardium, we give contrast and it gives us this very nice uh, silhouette of the heart muscle. And it just confirms that the severely impaired function, the ejection fraction is 14%. So with any given beat, only 14% of the content of the left ventricle is going out, whereas it should be more like 60%. And same again in a different view. Um, so we had a discussion about the potential etiology based on the echo findings. Obviously, we did discuss the CMR and PET, but just to give you my perspective on the echo findings, because it was such a generalized appearance, which involved both chambers, and because there was this sort of sparkled appearance of the septum in particular, we raised the possibility of an alternative etiology to sarcoidosis as a potential differential, uh, and that was amyloidosis. So that's the, that's the context. I guess we'll move on now to the CMR scan. Actually, Raj, before we go on to the CMR, because we always like to have a debate as we go through each case, um, with this patient um, who's presented with polyemboli, um, who had the CT scan, which shows some lymph nodes um, within the hyla, but no obvious um, kind of diagnosis of sarcoidosis elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, based on those um, echo images, what would you rate the probability of cardiac sarcoidosis just on echo alone? Yeah, I mean, with no evidence of sarcoidosis elsewhere, um, I think... I would definitely entertain the alternative possibilities because it's so generalized. Uh, and so an infiltrative disorder, so not a cardiomyopathy or a previous heart attack, an infiltrative disorder, some kind of inflammatory or infiltrative condition of which amyloidosis is one and potentially more common than sarcoidosis than someone who doesn't have sarcoidosis. Um, the, the, the right ventricular enlargement could have been a manifestation of the pulmonary embolus. That's quite possible. Uh, um, but there were a couple of features that weren't, didn't quite sit well with amyloidosis. Uh, and that was that uh, the right ventricle was enlarged, and the wall was thin. And the areas yeah. of where we see a lot of uh, the sparkling appearance was predominantly the septum with hindsight, and not so much in the other walls. So I think these were the, the, the alternative thoughts. Yeah, okay, thank you. So we'll come back to that. So I think John, um, I'm John Bakshio, MRI consultant, has got some images up. So John, do you want to take us through the MRI scan images? Thank you very much, Rakesh. Um, so just to start by showing a couple of the anatomy images. So while we're doing the initial scan, um, we get some views of really much of the thorax um, in three views at 90 degrees to each other. <clears throat> and although the image quality isn't brilliant, what we can see on the left-hand image here 
Um, these patchy areas here in the sort of middle of a picture at the edge of the heart are some lymph nodes. Obviously, lymph nodes can particularly have prominent and large point to sarcoidosis, but they can also be present for a number of other reasons. So if someone has heart failure and is prone to fluid accumulation on the chest, it is not uncommon to see some lymph nodes, although not usually to the extent we see in sarcoidosis. The reason for the right hand image is just to show this area at the um, uh, kind of bottom left of the image, which is a collection of fluid uh, around the lungs, uh, so a large right pleural effusion. <clears throat> Again, not typical, not commonly seen in sarcoidosis. So onto the moving images of the heart, the cine images, I'll just put a couple up at, at once. Um, so both the main pumping chambers of the heart, and there, if you look at this right hand, hand image, perhaps we'll just um, focus on the right hand image for simplicity. Um, so uh, curiously on the left hand side of your image is the right heart, so these two chambers, and on the right hand side of your image is the left heart. Um, and the upper chambers, upper two chambers are actually the main pumping chambers of the heart, in reality the lower two chambers, it's just the way the image is orientated. There's again a small rim of fluid around the heart, pericardial effusion, which is not common, although not unseen in cardiac sarcoidosis. And then the findings are really, as you've heard described in echocardiography, we've got significant enlargement of both the main pumping chambers of the heart, particularly the right ventricle, and really marked impairment of both the main pumping chambers. We got an ejection fraction of 18, 1.8% for each of the main pumping chambers. <clears throat> You can see here, although not as clearly as on echo, uh, significant leakiness of this valve here, the tricuspid valve, and less severe leakiness of the valve on the left-hand side of the heart, the mitral valve. And in general, the heart is, um, it's fairly global, the decreased contraction of the heart. We're not seeing very clear areas of thinning. The septum, the muscle between the two main pumping chambers of the heart is a little bit thick, but that's quite non-specific. For example, if you have not quite perfectly controlled high blood pressure, we often see that. But clearly very abnormal findings, particularly with the right heart and a dilated upper chamber on the right. Um, and these are similar findings from other views. This is specifically the, um, the right heart chamber, the main pumping chamber of the right, which is grossly reduced in its function. We did some edema imaging, um, and again, the quality of these images was not great. So uh, sometimes that is the case. And what I would normally say is uh, let's defer to PET imaging for, um, for the truth there. So without further ado, I'm going to go to the late gadolinium images, which are, as we discussed earlier, the key to uh, much of what MRI has to offer. And here we see the main pumping chamber of the heart side on and you see this extensive enhancement where the heart muscles are appearing white and actually the heart muscle should be appearing black on late enhancement where it's normal so there's extensive uh, fibrous tissue or infiltration by granuloma or some other substance but really seen throughout the heart uh, this is this four chamber view where we see all the chambers of the heart and again very extensive throughout the septum, uh, although with these areas where the gadolinium contrast couldn't penetrate the heart muscle, so where there is some lack of blood supply, particularly through the small vessels. Um, in the sort of what we call the lateral wall, the outer wall of the heart, the uh, enhancement is nearly <coughs> involving fibrosis of the whole thickness of the heart muscle and less so towards the tip of the heart. There's some enhancement of the trabeculae in the right heart, but as um, was observed on echo actually the thickness of the right side of the heart was was normal so i'm just going to go to the short axis views so 90 degrees to the other images and what we see is extensive enhancement just coming down from uh, the top of the main pumping chamber to the tip this heart muscle should really all be black dark um, and we're seeing almost a ring of enhancement in what's called the subendocardium, the area nearest the blood pool and the subepicardium. And interestingly, in this view here, you get the impression of that zebra stripe pattern um, that I showed you earlier, which is very, which is seen in amyloidosis. So um, uh, where you have some black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white. So um, 
this short axis view, particularly alongside some other things that um, were not necessarily typical for sarcoid and the absence of definite extracardiac involvement of sarcoid means that one really has to consider amyloidosis as a, as a possibility. That said, if we look at some of the other views, they fit very well with sarcoidosis, this extensive confluent um, regions of late enhancement. So um, we have really a, a balance between two diagnoses here. One is cardiac sarcoidosis um, and the other is cardiac amyloidosis. And um, the other question is, could the two coexist? Very rarely in the literature they have been, but I think uh, that is unlikely, um, but not impossible. Uh, yes, many of the features are consistent with sarcoidosis and some like the lack of right ventricular free wall thickening are against amyloidosis, but it is very difficult for us to ignore this pattern on late enhancement. So um, uh, it's sort of in the 50-50 range, really. It, it, you have evidence in favour of each diagnosis, not a perfect appearance for either diagnosis in isolation. Thank you, Rakesh. Okay, thank you, John. So just to recap, so... When it comes to um, these kind of patients who present to us, um, the advantage of the MDT is that we can all have a discussion together. We do debate at each point in terms of the scans, but it's good to come back to this later on, especially once we've looked at the, the PET report. So over to Shama. So um, I think uh, the way it happened was the possibility um, of amyloid versus sarcoid was 50-50. So I'll just share my screen uh, to show you what we did next. So um, because the possibility of amyloidosis was put high, there are two types of uh, amyloidosis. Um, one is TTR amyloidosis, one is um, AL amyloidosis. AL occurs in younger people, TTR occurs in older people, but both affect the heart. And they are again like storage disorders, but do not cause significant inflammation in the heart. So unlike sarcoid, um, the amyloid just sits into the heart, makes it thick and the but does not uh, take up FTG because it's not inflammatory. However, one type of scan, which is called as a, this is a wrong label, so please ignore that. Um, it is called as a DPD scan, which is basically looking at the bones. And uh, this DPD was used in the past to look at bones, but it did not um, um, satisfy the best criteria for high quality bone scan. So, it went out of fashion and we use some other product which is HDP or MDP for bone scans. But recently what was found out is that DPD is taken up in the amyloid heart, especially of TTR type, because amyloid contains some calcium and that's where the bone scan agent goes and you could see some uptake in the heart. Now in this particular patient, because the suspicion of TTR amyloidosis was uh, suggested, um, we did a DPD bone scan, and as you see, this is just a pure bone scan and didn't see anything on these uh, planar images, anything in the heart. So we also did uh, SPECT CT images, uh, which are here, and we look at the heart in more detail. Uh, and once again, there is, uh, apart from that occlusal uh, effusion, which was known from MRI, there is no uptake whatsoever in the heart. So the possibility of TTR amyloidosis is extremely low. So this was uh, this diagnosis was um, um, sort of put down on the uh, differential diagnosis list. So that was the situation uh, at that point of time. However, then then it came to light that um, you know why couldn't it be AL amyloidosis because this scan does not exclude uh, amyloidosis of another type which is called as AL amyloidosis. So we ended up doing um, a, well we had to send the patient away actually to uh, National Amyloidosis Center to get them to do an amyloid scan, which is called as a SAP scan to rule out uh, amyloidosis. And once again, on their scan, there was some hepatic congestion. That's why you see uptake in the liver and there was some uptake in the heart, but SAP is not ideal agent for looking at heart. So AL amyloidosis was excluded. So both of these pathologies were excluded. And um, so this is the situation. If you want to uh, take back uh, the discussion with Sirius at this point, I'm happy until I load the PET scan. 
Okay, so I'll bring Vasilis into the discussion as well, but it sounds as though um, we have got a bit of debate going on. Um, we've tried to um, go through two important differential diagnoses here, amyloidosis versus sarcoidosis. So Vasilis, as a respiratory expert, what would be your next step? No, no, I think that, um, Sam, I think that it would be nice for you to describe the PET and then we come to a discussion because we did have the two nuclear medicine scans, but we haven't seen the PET yet. Yeah. Okay, then I'll like show you my, uh, or show, show the FDG scan of this patient, which was very, uh, very, uh, what can I say, it's very characteristic. Um, I'll just show you these moving images, which we normally view. Um, let me just move the screen away so it doesn't interfere. So on these images, you, what we see is the whole body appearance uh, on the scan. And, you know, it is obvious that there is a take in the heart and in some lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are in the chest as well as some look like in the uh, upper abdomen. The kidneys excrete FDGs, therefore they are normally seen and so is the bladder. So those are normal appearances. So I'm just going through some images here. So I can show you things in detail to you. So just screen bigger so everyone can see. So I scroll through the images and then show you the sites of active inflammation, which look like in the nose. These are supraclavicular paratracheal. So that's the trachea, uh, the windpipe, and you can actually see air in it. And that's why we can differentiate it from the esophagus, which is next to it. And you can see inflammation in the nodes, which are near the trachea. And then again, there is this fluid effusion and you can start to see these hot nodes, which are quite intense in the um, mediastinum and in the uh, subcorinal region going into the bilateral hilar regions, which are where the trachea bifurcates into two bronchi. Um, as we are going through there, there are some foci within the lungs as well, as you see here. Um, if I just try to change the window here, I'll show you the lungs in a cleaner way and you can appreciate that there are some foci within the lung parenchyma um, which are active. So there are there is nodularity which is also showing inflammatory change. Switching back to the windows and going to now looking at the heart, you're already seeing very intense inflammation in the right ventricular myocardium. Um, then we are also seeing that um, in the interventricular septum, extremely intense inflammation and also going into the apex, also going to the apical lateral wall in the basal lateral wall. And this is the papillary muscle, which is also showing inflammatory activity into the lateral wall. And um, there was also a um, bit of inflammation in the left atrium as well as in the right atrium. So this is um, extensive and uh, quite uh, intense inflammation involving all four chambers of the heart. And normally, I would also give you the SUV values here as to how much inflammation this is by just um, checking this live. And I can tell you, put a little cursor on it, and I can measure the SUV value, which is basically telling us what is the proportion of injected FDG gone into specific region of the heart. So the SUV max here is going up to 11 or so. And these are patients who have got right ventricular inflammation. They have a Higher, higher substrate for inflammation and arrhythmias, and therefore these patients are at very high risk of arrhythmias. So this is a very concerning case. So I would have been alerted the MPT team immediately after having seen the scan to tell them that this patient does need um, management, quick management. And as I mentioned, you know, as we saw those nodes, there are some abdominal nodes as well. So in patients like this, the question is generally, you know, what is the, do we have a final proof? What is the underlying pathology? In all likelihood, this patient does have a sarcoidosis. And here is a, a, a screen where we have done a rubidium perfusion scan, where the perfusion is very spotty and very abnormal. Uh, and the ejection fraction is 29%, so very poor ejection fraction, um, which is particularly in the septum. And these are the perfusion metabolism uh, matching images. So when we match them together exactly slice by slice, what we see is that the areas which are showing poor perfusion, especially in the septum, also in the RV, in the anterolateral wall, those are the exact areas where there is inflammation. So because of massive inflammation, inflammation means edema, that means swelling, 
that swelling does not allow the blood supply to permeate into those areas. And therefore, this patient's um, perfusion scan is abnormal as a result. And there is a perfect metabolism perfusion mismatch. So this is like a sum total picture of the heart up uh, during of blood supply. And this is the sum total picture of the heart for inflammation. Areas which so, show reduced perfusion are showing very active inflammation. So this is 99% um, cardiac sarcoidosis. But for final confirmation, what is useful is that the lymph nodes, which can be biopsied, there are many of those uh, which can be which are amenable to biopsy for a histopathological uh, final confirmation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shama. So this is where imaging um, can actually sway the. Um, so going back to what we said originally with the echo, the echo features weren't typical for sarcoidosis, were more suggestive of infiltration. Um, also, the MRI scan was highly suggestive of infiltration, unusual for sarcoidosis. We didn't have any kind of extra cardiac evidence of sarcoidosis, apart from some lymph nodes in the chest. Um, but the PET scan actually um, strongly suggested sarcoidosis. So I remember we actually discussed this patient at our MDT meeting, um, and actually because of the risk of heart block and because of risk of ventricular arrhythmias, the patient also was on my list to put a device in the same afternoon straight after the MDT. And at the MDT, we decided that we needed um, some more evidence, ideally with tissue. So in our practice, as with other centers around the world, um, we tend to avoid taking tissue from the heart because in the heart, the disease is often patchy and you can often miss um, the site where the disease is and you can get a false negative result, which can have its own problems. Um, and also taking a heart biopsy, although it's low risk, is not without risk. But in this case, we all felt at the MDT that we really needed to make a definitive diagnosis because the management of amyloidosis versus cardiac sarcoidosis is very different. And also the outcome from the patient is likely to differ. So at the time of the defibrillator pacemaker implant, we also took a cardiac biopsy. And then the patient had the implant at that time. So Vasilis, can I bring you in here? Because obviously um, it's good to get your input now. So Rakesh, I think um, that this is a perfect example of um, the actual integration of all imaging and the clinician's perspective. I think that in, in reality, what led us to the decision about a cardiac biopsy was um, trying to balance the risk and benefits for this patient both now, both at the time of this, of what when this happened, but also in the long term. And um, on one hand, we had the report from ECHO and CMR that cardiac amyloidosis is on the cards, but the nuclear medicine scans were actually um, not supporting that. And um, we, I think, unanimous agreed that this patient was at a high risk of having a, a, a fatal arrhythmia. So the absolute um, number one indication was to put in a device. Normally, for every other patient, I think that we would um, consider doing a nebus bronchoscopy and take a biopsy of the lymph nodes rather than the heart, because that would be enough to support extracardiac sarcoidosis. In, the, in this particular occasion, we decided to go for the heart primarily because amyloidosis was the strong question but also because we heard from Sama that the right ventricle was particularly active and therefore the, po the, the, the site for a biopsy with minimal risk would be um, available. The third thing is that obviously in a, in a tertiary center hospital, we have experience in performing cardiac biopsies. It's not as, in a, as this is happening in a district general hospital and therefore um, we felt safer performing the, the procedure rather than not. And we tried to combine this with um, the device implantation. Um, I would just show that the result of the biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of sarcoidosis since it showed non necrotizing granulomas involved in the heart. And there was a concern about excluding TB, which we had. So in essence, this is, um, this, this, this um, uh, investigations led to a biopsy proven cardiac sarcoidosis on this occasion, which is quite rare 
in our in our service. Um, looking back, I think that um, we could have biopsy the lymph nodes and not the heart. So I think that this is open for discussion even between experts. Um, so um, that's that's my only comment. With regards to treatment, this patient has extensive disease, very high level of inflammation and impaired cardiac function. So we would like to give him maximum treatment from the outset. So we gave him intravenous steroids and that would be my recommendation about intravenous steroids following by steroids and um, a methotrexate combination. There are many, many things have been discussed as to whether this is the right option or for example, liver considering infliximab in, he, in his case, given the fact that it was um, a quite active disease uh, upfront. But we strongly feel that um, we are applying our historical knowledge from the lung disease to the heart disease, given the excellent responses that we have seen in the lung. Yes. So um, I think we're kind of having to sum up now because I think um, one or two of our panelists are going to have to leave. But it just shows that this case illustrates how the MDT approach is the only way to offer a diagnosis and management um, program. Um, when it comes to difficult cases, um, I mean, all cardiac sarcoidosis patients um, do have their own um, kind of nuances. Um, trying to put it together in MDT is the only way by which we can give um, these patients an accurate diagnosis. And in this particular situation, we've involved the um, National Amyloid Center, um, we've involved our histopathologists as well as our imaging experts. And at the end of the day, getting the diagnosis from biopsy means that we're confident going forward that the patient's on the right track for, for improvement. Um, and any more imaging you want to look at, Vesalis, in terms of the follow-up scans? We don't have a follow-up scan yet. Um, this will be in due course. Okay, fine. So I think because we've um, run over time, um, perhaps we should um, to summarize the day if that's okay. Um, yes. I'm very grateful to all the speakers um, for taking part in today. I'm very honored and grateful to Sarcoidosis UK for the ongoing support um, for our patient education programs. And of course, it goes without saying that um, Vasilis Kronis is the key um, for all these programs happening. Um, he works tirelessly for all patients um, and um, also for the research side. So I'm very, very grateful to him. Um, we'd like to um, get all of your feedback. Um, we're very encouraged by the active chat um, box and um, please do um, write to us and tell us what you thought of today. Um, we're always looking to improve these sessions. So if you think in the future, there's some areas which we need to include, then please do let us know. Uh, we hope to have another session in a few months time. And again, to improve access to our service, we're going to be um, putting together a dedicated email address um, for the sarcoidosis um, unit. And also hopefully we'll get more nurse led support as well. Um, Vasilis, do you want to say any closing comments? Um, Rakes, I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, I will start by saying that we are a team and I feel very strongly about it. I don't see anyone working more or less than anyone else. And that's the, that's the huge privilege of this service, that it is a joint, it has this joint fashion. I want to thank everyone um, from, the, from the attendees, uh, from the speakers, but also, as you said, Sarkoidosis UK for all the support. Um, we do want to hear your feedback. We don't want to hear how would you like our educational seminars to uh, continue. Um, we, we feel strongly about continuing this at least twice a year. I've showed you our new email for the cardiac sarcoidal service and feel free to use that to give us any recommendations, but also um, a post event um, survey will be circulated to all of you. And we will be keeping your emails about future events. Our annual sarcoidosis event will happen again in April of next year, as we have promised with uh, Sarcoidosis UK, um, trying to increase the awareness of the disease and try to deal the issues around the disease in general. Uh, thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time and for attending for today's um, seminar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.